One minute. <clears throat> Please take your seats as quickly as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We'll be starting in a few seconds. <clears throat> Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Athens. Thank you for coming. It's great to see so many of you here this morning. So, Effie will be starting our uh, presentation today, um, the workshop today, our international conference, also including Project Cycle Climate Imperative. And we have a special guest today, Mr. Alan Baker from Professor, excuse me. <laughs> who is on our advisory board for GOLD, and he will be chairing the workshop today. He's a legend in cycle remediation, so we are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are honoured to have him here today, so thank you very much for coming. Okay, so I'll pass over to Effie then. 
So, good morning from my side. Thank you very much, Emma. I would like to thank you, Alan Baker, for accepting the invitation to be with us today and to be a member of the advisory board. It's our honor. And I would like to thank you, the co two coordinators of uh, the project Ceresis and Fit to Climate. Of course, Dr. Maria Georgiadou for accepting to be here, always supporting to us. And I would like to thank you so much. And uh, today, the idea of the workshop is to present as a group of three projects what we're doing on this uh, hot subject on growing on contaminated uh, uh, land, taking biomass and producing clean by uh, liquid biofuels. And in this uh, topic, we were three projects. And that's why as a whole, we try to present each of us how we deal the same topic. We have several similarities, but we have a difference, and this is the good thing, because if we put together, we can take more information. So um, each of the project uh, will present what they are doing on phytoremediation, on growing on contaminated land, how they produce clean liquid biofuels, and the majority of the project, they have decision support system like Ceresis, and because Ceresis is about to close next month, we are happy to see the decision support system. I'm so happy that you managed to come. It was very difficult to organize because the previous two days we had meet us meeting and the, in this meeting we had 60 persons. But I'm so ha happy that finally we made it. So I will start with a very brief presentation of what is gold. More or less, it's the same with the other two projects. And if they want the coordinators to come here to say a few things, it will be my pleasure. You know the risk, the challenges and the opportunities for gold project. We know that there is big area contaminated. At the same time, we need feedstock for biomass uses. We don't want to take for food and feed. And we want energy crops that are tolerate the contaminants, heavy metal or organics. Uh, you know, red two, now red three, we need low I look feedstock. And we have several targets now update. This is all because it was from our proposal. And that what we want to do, we want to use the contaminated land at the same time to clean them if possible, because this is a very optimistic scenario, as Eleni always mentioned to me. And But we want to take biomass and to produce clean biofuel production. All of the project, more or less, I saw from another meeting, we have one work packages on growing on contaminated sites. We have one package in doing the conversion to clean liquid biofuels. We have maybe one or two work packages doing sustainability, decision support system, uh, or in our case, we do a model. We have this dissemination uh, and coordination. All of us, we have international partners, and you can see it from the other project. Usually we have Canada, China, India, and I think in the case of services, you have Brazil, and also for fit to climate, it's Brazil, I think. Argentina, better, much better. <laughs> Very nice place. <laughs> anyway, so we build all of us in three pillars. Uh, the first pillar, as I mentioned before, is growing on contaminated site uh, with selected energy crops. The second pillar, this to be clean liquid biofuels, it's, this is a challenge because we want to take the contaminants in concentrated form. And at the same time, we want the whole system to be sustainable and if possible to have prediction scenario to understand in how many years we can clean um, a contaminated site. And um, this is a, just a, a very simple graph. I know Jaco that is going to follow after uh, Dr. Maria Georgiadou, uh, Professor Yangosvel is going to present a so sophisticated graph. So it's a very simple one that we are doing phytoremediation uh, in our project and we use mycorrhiza and biostimulants. Again, the three pillars, I don't stay on that. And for gold, what we are doing on, in gold, we selected four uh, crops, two annual, two perennials, uh, sorghum and hemp, and in terms of perennial, miscanthus and switchgrass. I think the majority of you, uh, you have, I think, common is a miscanthus to everybody, if I'm not mistaken. 
and um, we try to follow um, a protocol for low input practices. This, this is mandatory for energy crops. We want to be low carbon farming. And at the same time, we put the emphasis on the common protocol. This was mandatory by Eleni, all the partners to follow the same protocol. Why? In order to compare our results finally. And in this, it, he, she insists a lot. That's why more or less we have the same field, but each of us grow three crops. In my case, I just put a graph, it, it was sorghum, miscanthus, and switchgrass. All of us, we have miscanthus. The sites we have from Europe, uh, here you lose some colors, I don't know why. I noticed uh, yesterday and the previous two days, I think, it's better there, but you cannot uh, do that. Anyway, we have uh, France, we have uh, Poland, uh, Greece, and Italy. In Greece, we have two sites. And apart from this, we have two Chinese sites and one site in India. Eleni, as an expert, will say more on this. And we have two conversional routes for gold. And when we tried to write the proposal in order to avoid the risk, we thought not to mix the partners doing the conversion process in Europe and the ones do it in Canada. So one a route is dedicated for the, can for the European partners, high thermal gasification. And the other one is uh, uh, developed by University of Selbrook. And you are going to see more by Nicolas Sabadzoglu, professor from Selbrook. And of course, we want to combine the contaminated site, the selected crops, and phytoremediation practices, and to make scenarios for phytoremediation. Now in gold, what we are doing, apart from our cases, that is within the project, we have partners with uh, trials uh, in the view of previous project, a lot of them. So Eleni and Michelle from uh, Michelle Menz from INRAE, they try now to develop a deliverable, put all the information that we know, not only from our project, but from previous project. And of course, literature will be there in order to collect as much possible, inform as much information as possible. So uh, the project highlight what we do, all we do, we grow in selected high yielding lignocellulose crops on contaminated land. We try to uh, have clean liquid biofuels. I think in the majority of the case, we manage this. And we have, in, in the case of uh, gold, two conversional routes, one uh, high thermal gasification, and the second is autothermal pyrolysis. And we want to develop optimized phytoremediation strategies. And of course, we organize value chains and we're working on that with a model. And Giacomo Taluzzi from Record is going to present what we're doing in gold of this. And finally, of, of us, we have as a target to work in, on international collaboration of biofuels. That's why we have uh, several countries outside of Europe. So we want to be with mission innovation on biofuels. Uh, this is what, from my side, I try to be short. So I would like to invite if the coordinators of the other two projects just to welcome us, don't be shy, uh, just to say, to stand and see, I'm the coordinator of each project. And uh, I think, please, I, Thanos and Marcus, come with us. Yes. Yes, good morning, uh, everyone. Also from my side, uh, my name is Markus Ordner. I'm the coordinator of uh, Fight to Climate. And I'm really happy to see so many people here. Thank you very much, uh, Effie, for this uh, nice introduction. What can I add? Our project is a sister project of gold. As Effie already said, so our focus is more or less the same. The only difference what we have is uh, that we have different sites. And also later on in the um, valorization of the biomass into, oh, sorry, uh, into added value products is different. How this uh, going to work, we will see a little bit later in the presentation of uh, Snesana, colleague from Serbia, and also Christopher Kick from Germany, who is not here, but he will be uh, online okay. with us. Thank you very much. Hello from my side, I'm Thanos Redizelas. I'm the coordinator of the project Ceresis. Um, again, uh, Ceresis has a similar aim as uh, gold and uh, future climate. 
Uh, we're slightly different in the approach. We're mostly focusing on Python management, as uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, uh, Richard Lord, will tell you later on. Uh, we're focusing mostly on canary grass, but also other energy crops. Uh, so that's from the photoremediation side. And from the conversion side, again, the technologies are slightly different. So we're looking at supercritical water gasification, which is a subset of gasification. And we're also looking at uh, fast pyrolysis, which is, again, pyrolysis, but different style, different type than uh, what in gold. Uh, we also have a, a uniqueness. We're focusing on a decision support system, which I'm going to explain later on. Uh, but generally, we all have the same aim. Uh, just uh, trying in different ways to, to tackle the same problem. I think that if we put all together, we have many sites and many conversion rules. So each of us has a lot of similarities and difference, but as a whole, we provide a, many so a lot of solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to be all together and on this to show to the public. So thank you very much for the invitation, Effie. Thanks. And looking forward, looking forward to the day. Thank you very much, Marcus and Thanos, for the excellent collaboration all of these years. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maria Georgiadou, our officer. Sorry. And I will need the help of Emma. Um, Emma, please. I'm not the expert on this. Can you help us to go to the next presentation? Ah. OK. We can <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Effie. Okay, okay, go, go, go inside. Ah, sorry, sorry. I, I forgot to mention that we have, together with us, a delegation from Texas University. And uh, after the coffee break, I will invite the team of, uh, uh, of this delegation to say a few words for this. So we are about 25 experts on energy, and they have a bilateral with Greece. Uh, and then uh, the thing, I think they have a name of the project that the name is Metabasis. George, George, the name of the project is Metabasis. Okay, you can, the leader of the team can present later on. Okay, thank you for coming. So we are ready. So, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, good morning. It's a pleasure again to be. Um, uh, here to inform uh, about the Commission uh, priorities, uh, the Commission funding in the area of uh, renewable fuels and biofuels. I am not uh, the project officer, as uh, Effie said, but I am uh, the program, um, uh, program <laughs> uh, responsible for the um, Horizon Europe. In uh, fact, uh, what we do, we look at the strategy and the ways to go in supporting the research uh, in the area. So uh, I think most of you know me already. I don't need to say I work for DG Research and Innovation, and I hold the position of a senior expert in uh, renewable uh, energies, and in particular for research and innovation in renewable fuels. So uh, all, all this funding comes out of a general framework policy, and this framework policy is uh, outlined here. Uh, first of all, uh, everybody knows the European Green Deal, uh, which is implemented by the Fit for 55, which is uh, 15 legislative uh, uh, now laws, most of them, plus, uh, plus uh, the hydrogen markets. Uh, plus the Repower EU, which uh, for the energy security and under which we have the Biomethane Action Plan and the Biomethane Industrial Partnership to bridge uh, uh, the gap of uh, 3.5 BCM produced today and a little bit less in Europe to 35 BCM billion cubic meters in uh, 2030. We have the hydrogen and the decarbonized uh, gas uh, markets uh, package, and this actually looks on how to bring uh, more uh, renewable and low carbon gases uh, into the market of, uh, of gases in, uh, in uh, EU by 2030. Uh, uh, renewable gases can be both from biomass and synthetic and low carbon gases are recycled as long as they have 70% greenhouse gas emissions uh, savings on a life cycle basis. We have um, something which is extremely important is the European uh, uh, net Zero uh, Industry Act under the Green Deal Industrial Plan. This is something that I will uh, uh, okay cover this. 
Um, this is actually the Green Deal Industrial Plan and the EU Net Zero Industry Act. We have reached a provisional agreement there. What is important is that there is a target, and this target is 40% of uh, all uh, uh, deployment uh, needs uh, for uh, strategic net zero um, technologies by 20, uh, 2030 to happen uh, by net zero technologies here in the EU domestically. And uh, there is a bunch of net zero technologies. Um, now uh, the technologies are opened to include, uh, apart from the renewable electricity and heat, also the sustainable biogas and biomethane, but also the sustainable alternative fuel technologies and the renewable fuels of non-biological origin technologies. Of course, hydrogen electrolyzers, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it is important. This means that we will have net zero strategic projects. This net zero strategic projects will be based on these technologies. And uh, these technologies uh, really can take off because it means manufacturing in Europe. And um, um, so we, we need uh, to support these uh, innovative technologies with research and innovation. Another uh, um, policy instrument is what we call strategic technologies for Europe platform. This is another way to boost investments in critical technologies in Europe. And we are talking among others, clean technologies, which is renewable energies. And this includes uh, renewable, uh, sustainable alternative fuels, but also includes biotechnologies, meaning biomanufacturing of uh, many products, included, uh, including biofuels. And there is now a biotech uh, initiative and uh, biofuels are included in this uh, biotech initiative. So STEP is a way of um, leveraging money from various existing sources, like the EU or the Innovation Fund, the Horizon Europe, but also new money. And uh, um, I think 50 billion are going to put down and uh, 160 billion are going to be leveraged in new investments. So that's the ambitions uh, to support. I show you that in order to understand that there is a uh, policy behind and there is support in the area in which you are working. Uh, finally, uh, something which is very relevant to the topic here is this uh, delegated act uh, to the Red 2 and the list of the feedstocks. This is uh, um, from the public uh, uh, consultation that happened, I guess, one or more years ago. And still the debate is ongoing. And uh, the debate is uh, where to put uh, the intermediate crops uh, and where to put uh, the crops that come from degraded lands that are, are not already included in Annex 9A, meaning the non lignocellulosic Where to put them? To put them in Part A and to put them in Part B. Part B means uh, there is a cap, there is a limitation of 1.7% because there where the wastes are treated, or if you put it in Part A, they are unlimited. But this is still ongoing, the discussions, it has not closed yet. And of course, uh, all biomass is necessary from marginal lands, from contaminated lands, from degraded lands. In particular, if we look at the very demanding targets that we have put uh, in uh, biofuels, in particular for aviation and maritime. Horizon Europe, you're, I guess, all familiar with, uh, with the pillars. Um, energy is uh, funded under the Pillar 2 and the Cluster 5 Energy, Climate and Mobility, but energy is funded from the other pillars as well. It is funded from uh, the uh, ERC, which is Fundamental Research, and they are the fellowships, let's say, and the uh, networking uh, uh, between the universities. It is funded from the EIC. The EIC is the third pillar, and it is the European Institute uh, for um, Innovation, or Council for Innovation. And there we have uh, three programs, the Pathfinder, the uh, Transition, and the Accelerator. And all these three uh, have programs in uh, projects in energy. And there we have uh, uh, funding for um, renewable fuels as well. This is what is passed right now, the work program 23-24 under the area of renewables energy in cluster five. Uh, it is almost going to finish. It is to show to you that we have financing for advanced biofuels, synthetic renewable fuels, intermediate bioenergy carriers. Uh, we have international collaboration like yours with integrated biorefineries and other topics, uh, horizontal topics. And now we are preparing the work program 2025. 
Uh, it is part of the three years last uh, remaining Horizon Europe program. And um, the budget will be limited and it will not be as large as this program shown here. But here are the remaining uh, topics on renewable fuels for synthetic fuels on international. And this is something that uh, you should look at. This is uh, on the development of uh, integrated biorefineries that produce together advanced biofuels and ESCO products, uh, chemicals and uh, biomaterials. And uh, this is open to mission innovation that I was already mentioned. Mm -hmm. It is open to uh, participants in mission innovation, mission integrated biorefineries. And uh, the goal, as uh, you will see here, is to have zero waste, uh, neutral or negative carbon emission, energy efficient biorefinery uh, concepts that uh, will um, have uh, produce uh, biofuels at a very low cost, lower than uh, now. And uh, this will be uh, possible through co production of added value, bio-based products and uh, bioenergy. The feedstocks we are looking at are biogenic waste uh, and residues, alkali and aquatic biomass. And the processes are open to everything possible, chemical, biochemical, electrochemical, biological, thermochemical, combination of them, uh, the idea is to have a high circular uh, approach here. I mean, no, as I said, zero waste. And um, uh, this will be proven by the mass and energy balances. This should be submitted with uh, the proposal and um, uh, it should produce uh, the process heat and the power that it is uh, necessary. It should the concept uh, capture and reuse the uh, biogenic effluent uh, gases, the CO2, or sequestering, uh, um, like producing biochar uh, as a soil amendment or um, uh, other um, uh, overall to maximize the mass and the energy efficiencies. Uh, we will uh, have to look at uh, the uh, feedstock uh, supply costs and the regional and local level and improve the feedstock mobilization, including uh, via enabling uh, technologies uh, like the digitalization and artificial intelligence. Of course, um, uh, concepts like uh, what, what it does for the environment, socioeconomically also impacts uh, and um, uh, also uh, to reduce uh, the cost, as I say, at parity with marketed uh, biofuel uh, products. So technology should be validated in a relevant environment if required and should provide uh, information and assessment about the feasibility and the possibility of scaling up because the next step here is really to scale up. I would like to bring to your attention another uh, possible funding source and this is called Clean Energy Transition Partnership. How does this work? For those who are um, uh, familiar with uh, the ERANETs, this is a large ERANET. Uh, it brings uh, the um, actions of uh, the uh, set plan, the strategic energy technology plan, 10 actions together under a co-fund program. The commission uh, participates with one third of the funding and the two thirds of the funding are from the participant uh, uh, agencies, which are national agencies, but it could be also international agencies. So we have plus 30 countries and uh, which are from Europe, from uh, associated countries and international partners. And we have more than 50 international and national funding agencies. Every year there are an annual call about 100, 130 million. Um, there is usually two stages. The first stage is the international call. And there is a, a national, a, re, a regional part that it is evaluated after the uh, uh, international call. So we have uh, uh, now evaluating the 23 call and the projects will start in uh, sometime in September, but there will be another call that will open, uh, will be launched in uh, June this year, 2024, and will open in September, 2024. So stay tuned, it will be announced in the commission uh, services and the, the, the content now, there are modules under, under each call. If they decide where to fund, this year we funded hydrogen and renewable fuels, but this is a hot topic and probably it will be repeated. So stay tuned for June.
Uh, something which is related also in general to the biofuels work and to the work done here is a recent uh, project that we completed, an RTD study on the development of outlook for the necessary means to build industrial capacity for drop-in advanced biofuels. It was published last month. And uh, we looked at various concepts. As <coughs> the objective was uh, to identify the factors that uh, will help the industrial growth of advanced sustainable biofuels production in the EU, which is actually under the framework for policy of the EU, not outside. So there are many key messages. I'm sure you cannot read them there, but uh, the idea is that um, uh, we need, uh, the policy brings some targets uh, for the demand of uh, biofuels. And it, it shows from the study that the biofuels will play a critical role, not only in 2030, but also later on in uh, 2050, 2030 and beyond. So there is a, actually, from the simulations under the policy framework of the Fit for 55, allowing some uh, sensitivity, let's say, for uh, um, going above uh, um, uh, targets uh, for renewable fuels of non-biological origin covered by advanced biofuels, it was shown that uh, there will be overall for biofuels uh, between uh, 32 to uh, 40 MTOEs, uh, and uh, half of this will be advanced biofuels. And there will be a big part of biofuels based on Annex uh, 9, Part B where all these uh, feedstocks that you are working all uh, in Annex 9 uh, are uh, um, accumulated. So uh, that's a fact from the simulation. If we have the supply, yes, the uh, study did also uh, some uh, analysis on the supply of the feedstock, and it found that uh, technically there is uh, 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 a lot of uh, potential uh, in uh, in uh, Europe, domestic potential, uh, it uh, is from 310 to 836 million dry tons in 2030 and similar in 2050. But somehow uh, this depends on how you mobilize this biomass, depending on, this is a, a, a feedstock in Annex 9, Annex 9, Part A and Part B. Depends how you mobilize this uh, feedstock, if uh, it is a low, a uh, high or a medium, uh, mobilization, then you can fulfill the whole demand or not. And what was also important to show is that the marginal lands, contaminated lands, and degraded lands will progressively play a more important role as we will need more and more of these types of fuels. And the industry, on the other hand, can, uh, for the moment, uh, um, provide minimum capacity, and the message is that we need to bring capacity, we need to make plants actually, to build new plants, to uh, bring uh, the capacity at the levels of the demand. And if we do that, we will have uh, quite uh, some important uh, socioeconomic impacts, uh, also greenhouse gas emission savings, and uh, uh, jobs, I think uh, 500,000 jobs already, new jobs in uh, 2030 and two, uh, and uh, even more in uh, 2050. And we will uh, contribute to the GDP. Here are some publications that we did for Horizon 2020 projects that uh, um, include aviation biofuels, road biofuels, and uh, uh, also maritime uh, biofuels, but also there is one on bioplaty view, which is before this, uh, this project, and it shows for marginal and contaminated lands what are the case studies that showed some possibilities and what are, what are the potentials in this. So this is uh, for you to download if you want to be informed. And there is uh, another uh, uh, illustration that uh, we um, provide uh, information on biomethane and how you can produce uh, carbon negative fuels under Horizon Europe projects. Here are the projects for your information. And this is the overall concept that includes not only traditional anaerobic digestion, but also includes gasification and artificial photosynthesis and any kind of fermentation of um, uh, organic matter, also uh, algae. Um, here is another report for your information uh, that shows uh, the technology status uh, and uh, the research uh, that is ongoing 
on uh, all the technologies uh, that are available to produce innovatively biomethane. You can also download it there. And here is a list of projects uh, on uh, uh, renewable uh, energy projects on degraded lands uh, from 2014 to 2023. Uh, so it, uh, it really covers uh, both Horizon 2020 and uh, Horizon uh, Europe projects. And you see that we have uh, finance, both research and innovation and uh, innovation and CSAs. And you see per year, um, depending uh, on the year, how this finance uh, was going. Phyto remediation, your topic, was financed in the last call of uh, 2020, Horizon 2020. There is a thought of uh, going to larger scale with phyto remediation, but uh, this uh, will depend, of course, on the results and the needs uh, that uh, the, uh, the current projects and the analysis uh, that you are doing will show. And, but also this is related to the Delegated Act uh, uh, and the crops that will be included in uh, the Annex 9. So, final words for mission innovation. Mission innovation is mentioned in the topic of your uh, projects. It was mentioned as Sustainable Biofuels Innovation Challenge. This was true back then. Today it is called the Mission Innovation 2. And there is a is organized in missions. We have one mission under integrated biorefineries. So we want to produce collectively advanced biofuels, but also biochemicals and biomaterials, and uh, actually subsidy 10% of the fossil carbon in 2030 by biogenic carbon in all these areas. The coal is are India and Netherlands. Uh, we are members uh, and uh, along with UK, Brazil, and Canada. And we have also IEA Bioenergy and uh, um, uh, uh, CAM Biofuture Initiative to support. Here are the activities in three pillars. Uh, we both doing uh, research and development, pilots, demos, but also a market and regulation. And I show you what is the work plan for 2024. Actually, it is uh, to make joint projects for uh, 24 between all those countries that participate. So uh, I think that one of the impacts of these projects uh, enhancing collaboration under uh, Sustainable Biofuels internationally will be important to further support the mission uh, integrated biorefineries. And I think all those uh, international partners that they seek for funding from their countries, they should go and mention the mission, mission in a way, uh, integrated biorefineries to them and to the relevant departments uh, in order to um, be eligible for funding. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and here are some useful links for your information. Thank you. Just to, just to let you know that uh, we thought to have the questions at the end of the okay. first session uh, in order to speed up. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. And All right now, it's um, it's my pleasure to um, bring uh, Jacko to the uh, to the stand. I think most people know Jacko. He's um, he's been in the game for a very long time, um, not too long, uh, but he did explain that he's um, he's coming up to retire, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have him to give a keynote on phytoremediation and phytomanagement of polluted soils. So it's a, an integrating approach to both uh, organically contaminated and inorganically contaminated soils. So the floor is yours, Jacko. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, indeed, uh, we are uh, already working quite a number of years in the field of phytoremediation. Uh, Michel Mensch there is also one of the pioneers uh, from the early 90s. And um, so uh, what I want to tell you is a bit of basics concerning uh, phytoremediation and then experiments that we already did uh, in the past and of course conclusions we could uh, take from them. Introduction will be very short. Uh, uh, everybody knows there is a lot of uh, polluted land and groundwater uh, in Europe, and a lot of that land cannot be used for food and feed production, and uh, there is a need for uh, remediation. And uh, we know that the traditional uh, clean-up techniques for polluted land and groundwater 
like excavation or pump and treat and so on, that they are simply very expensive, uh, very uh, environmentally invasive, and also very labor intensive. So in fact, for um, bigger uh, areas, it is not possible to apply them. Uh, and what is done mostly uh, done, that is nothing. Eh? The pollution is staying there. And uh, so uh, nobody will work on it due to the too high uh, cost price. But then, um, yeah, uh, in the early 90s, uh, the idea came up, can bio-based technologies offer an alternative? And in fact, nature is providing us plenty of tools. Uh, there are a lot of microorganisms, and with microorganisms, I mean then not only the bacteria, but also the archaea, the fungi, protists. And uh, we have plants. We, have talking, we were talking already a lot about plants. And we have the combination of plants with microorganisms. And in fact, that is bringing us to uh, phytoremediation, which I like to define as using plants and their associated microorganisms to remove, to degrade, or detoxify organic and inorganic pollutants in soil, groundwater, sediments. But, and I will not speak about it today, but also in air, you can uh, have a very nice uh, applications of it. Mm. So in soil and groundwater, uh, we have many types of pollution. We have the trace elements, the so-called heavy metals. Huh? Uh, we have salts, we have phosphates, we have organic pollutants. And organic pollutants, you have uh, the ones that uh, occur in higher concentrations, for instance, the petroleum-based uh, uh, products. But you also have all these uh, persistent organic pollutants um, often associated with uh, pesticides uh, that are very persistent uh, in soils uh, and in groundwater, so very recalcitrant against any uh, degradation. But I want to start with a few important considerations uh, concerning plant-based technologies. Uh, not everybody is, uh, in fact, realizing that evapotranspiration is very important uh, when you speak about plant-based um, or biologically-based remediation. Um, I will not go in detail to this, but um, we uh, should uh, realize that plants are transpiring a lot of water. They are pumping a lot of water from soil, from groundwater, to the atmosphere. And that is, in fact, that pump mechanism, that is, in fact, what we want to use uh, for our remediation uh, activities. And so, in fact, uh, like it is uh, presented here, a, a plant can be considered as a solar-driven pump and treat mechanism. Uh, to give you an idea, that is a calculation that we made and we checked a few times uh, uh, that, uh, sorry, that a poplar tree, not a big one, let's say a middle-sized poplar tree, uh, is consuming um, about 260 liters of water per day. So when you have then uh, an hectare uh, with uh, poplar trees, poplar shrubs, in fact, then uh, you can have in six months' time an evaporation of 4.2 million liters of uh, water. So that is quite a volume uh, uh, when you compare it to what pumps can do. And it is simply solar powered. So that is an important point I think we have to mention. And then even more important is that the plant is much more than what you can see. We always watch the plant, but we don't realize that there are uh, microorganisms in the rhizosphere, so outside the roots. There are uh, microorganisms inside the roots. And there are also microorganisms uh, everywhere on the plant. And these microorganisms, they uh, are there not for nothing. Huh? So uh, in fact, the plant likes to have them there. And I want to show just a few things about it because they are promoting the growth of plants. Yeah, like we, uh, we are also carrying quite a lot of microbes with us. Uh, uh, probably you don't realize, but uh, you, you, when you stand on a balance, uh, about one and a half kilogram, kilogram of what you can see on the uh, screen of the balance 
that is for the bacteria that you're carrying with you. Right? So you may always reduce your weight with one and a half kilogram. Uh, so, but plants also have the same. Uh, without these bacteria, we cannot live. They are very crucial for us, our microbiome. But for the plant, it is the same. A plant has a really an essential microbiome and th that is promoting the growth of the plants. Everybody knows the rhizobiums uh, uh, that are promoting growth, that are doing uh, nitrogen fixation and are promoting growth of plants. Uh, but there are also bacteria that are solubilizing phosphorus, that are solubilizing uh, iron. In fact, you can consider them as biofertilizers. That is something most people know. What less people know is that uh, many plants, uh, many plant growth promoting bacteria, they are uh, producing plant growth hormones. So plant growth hormones produced by bacteria and fungi. Huh? So they are in fact, promoting the growth of the plants, especially the roots, uh, the roots, they are uh, growing much better. And of course, in the frame of our phytoremediation, that is uh, quite uh, important. They are reducing the stress for the plants. Uh, plants uh, like we also experience a lot of stress. Uh, uh, the, the climate change, for instance, is a stress for the plant, but also when there are metals or other uh, pollutants in the soil, that's a stress for the plant. The plant is then producing stress hormone, that is uh, ethylene, uh, and an immediate precursor of that ethylene, uh, ACC, one amino cyclopropane, one carboxylic acid for the people who are interested in it. They are, uh, well, that precursor is consumed by bacteria, and so the plant is experiencing less stress. And there is also an indirect way of growth promotion that there is a fight, a continuous fight between uh, the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, so uh, the pathogens, they are in fact um, um, fighted away by uh, the plant growth promoting bacteria. So uh, how can we exploit plants and their associated microorganisms for remediation? Very short about metals and uh, organics, trace elements and organics. For trace element polluted soils, we have in fact uh, two main uh, options, that is phytostabilization and uh, phyto uh, extraction. Uh, phytostabilization, that is in fact just stabilizing uh, the polluted soil. Uh, it is uh, reducing the percolation of the pollutants to the groundwater, uh, is reducing the uh, wind erosion, water erosion. So in fact, what you do then is risk reduction, but it is not a real clean up. And uh, phyto extraction, that is what we are talking about quite often. Uh, uh, that means that the pollutants are taken up in the harvestable parts of the plants. And um, that then, of course, with that biomass that is produced, we can also do something uh, uh, for instance, biofuel production, we have heard the word already quite often today. So phytostabilization, very brief summarize, it is not real clean up. Uh, it is just a stabilization of a polluted uh, substrate. You bring a um, functioning uh, ecosystem on a polluted site uh, so that there is no wind and water erosion anymore and um, that there is... Um, uh, so that the impact of the polluted site on the neighboring ecosystems is much lower. Plants, they can stabilize uh, metals um, with uh, different processes, biochemical processes, uh, surface absorption, accumulation within the roots, which is very important that a lot of metals, in fact, are accumulated in roots or bound to roots, uh, precipitation, and so on. Um, and um, so is there a role for plant-associated microorganisms in phytostabilization? Yes, a big role, uh, but we will not go in detail to it. We don't have the time for it, but um, plant-associated microorganisms are, in fact, uh, a bit um, like a life insurance for the plants, and they also can reduce or increase the element uptake 
uh, for all of the elements in the plants. There are plenty of publications about it, um, uh, also very recent ones. As you can see, in 2024, there were two nice reviews about it. Uh, you can also use soil amendments. That is something that is uh, also done quite often. Um, so, so add something to the soil. Uh, some, like very traditional way in agriculture is add some lime to a soil and then uh, the trace elements, they will be uh, precipitated. The solubility will be much lower, um, but there are also other options. Uh, there are many. Uh, soil amendments that can be used. Just uh, to illustrate it with an old field experiment that he started in uh, 1990, uh, you see there an old uh, zinc smelter site uh, in Belgium. Um, there were uh, hundreds of hectares, like you can see there, without any vegetation on it. And in case of wind, it was a bit like uh, in the Sahara. Huh? So the pollution was blown around uh, not only to neighboring ecosystems, but also <clears throat> to the people's gardens. And so there we applied pollutant immobilizing soil amendments and we were sowing some trace element intolerant grasses. And you can see uh, uh, very soon there was uh, some green visible instead of this. And uh, so uh, 12 years later, uh, it was already a nicely uh, developed ecosystem. Another place in the south of France, north of Carcassonne, uh, where there was a really, sorry, very heavily uh, polluted site um, due to uh, arsenic mining. And uh, so that was uh, something very bad in the landscape. And they wanted to have it a bit more nice. And then you see in 2006, the whole site was uh, sown with plants, species from the local origin. And uh, then you can see uh, so many years later, 2022, uh, we went there. And then, in fact, the whole um, polluted site was very nicely integrated in the landscape. It looked uh, like the natural landscape there. So that is phytostabilization. I will not show your results, but <clears throat> it was very nice to see how much the spreading of the pollution there was uh, reduced. So <clears throat> it um, reduces leaching uh, and bioavailability of the pollutants. And especially important for the politicians is that there is an aesthetic profit. But I think for us, the most important is that it has um, profit for the environment and for human health. Phyto extraction, um, yeah, that is something, uh, Alan, we were discussing already quite often about it. Uh, what, were we, what are we dreaming about? That is a crop with high biomass production uh, that is taking up a lot of um, uh, metals. Uh, and uh, so that would allow to remove uh, a lot of metals in a very short uh, time. But uh, what do we have? Hmm? We have some hyper accumulators of metals uh, and most of them, especially uh, let's say in Europe, they are quite small uh, when they, well, to the accumulators of, uh, of uh, zinc and cadmium, they are quite small, but nickel hyper accumulators there are quite big ones. Alisum, you can grow with a bit of fertilization uh, on a very high size. And um, the problem of these hyperaccumulators for the zinc and cadmium is also that there is, in fact, no added value. You cannot really produce um, biofuel with it. Um, and uh, only the nic nickel hyperaccumulators, they haven't had added value because nickel is quite expensive on the world market. And so you can, uh, in fact, do some kind of nickel mining. For zinc and cadmium, it is not profitable because the zinc price is too low. Uh, and cadmium, nobody wants to buy it from you. So why should you, uh, why, why should you uh, produce it? Huh? So um, that is what we have uh, from hyperaccumulators. In fact, only for nickel, uh, it can work. For 
more normal uh, crop species, uh, well, they have in general uh, a low accumulation co in comparison to the hyperaccumulators. They have a low accumulation of uh, metal, uh, of trace elements, um, but they produce a lot of biomass. And they have, of course, uh, an added economic value. Uh, you can um, have some trace elements recovered, but especially you have fiber, you can have fiber or oil or essential oils out of it. And we are often not speaking about these essential oils, but uh, in fact, that is also a promising uh, application on polluted land, because in the oil there you don't have accumulation of trace elements. And uh, you know, some oils, uh, they are quite expensive. And so it can bring you it can bring the farmer a, a, a nice income. So field trials using hyperaccumulators, there were a lot, uh, Alan. Uh, and uh, yeah, in fact, only for nickel, you can say that it really uh, works. With high biomass, the first experiments started uh, already, uh, let's say, about 25 years ago. Um, so non-food crops with an economic valorization potential uh, that started, uh, and we are still working on it, in fact, uh, because also in the projects that, were, uh, this, that we will discuss here, um, we will still continue working on that. Um, in fact, uh, what is very important is that there is trace element uptake and that we know where the trace elements will go in the post-harvest processes so that they will not end up in a soil uh, or uh, in another chain bringing it to, uh, the, uh, to uh, human beings. And uh, what is also uh, still uh, necessary is to study the economics of the different options, which are the best available technologies. Uh, and that is, I think, the, the crucial point in the whole thing uh, that is, are there economic consequences uh, of a shift of growing that kind of plants for the farmers? Because the farmers, they will have a crucial role in the whole thing. If you don't have the farmers that want to produce uh, your crops, hmm, uh, if it are fiber crops or uh, uh, biomass crops, if they don't want to produce it, you can forget about it. Eh? So for them, there must be a profit in it. And I think we are coming closer and closer uh, to uh, evaluation, uh, to a good evaluation of it. This is uh, our few data from a very old uh, field experiment that we did in the northeast of Belgium near a zinc smelter. You see with uh, pollution of cadmium and lead. Uh, and uh, so that was also already about uh, nine hectares with uh, all kinds of plant species, mainly woody species, poplar, willow, uh, but also rapeseed, sunflower, uh, fiber hemp, uh, maize, and so on. Uh, and uh, so it was really done at, let's say, a normal scale in collaboration, collaboration with farmers. And then uh, at the end, you are going to uh, calculate the uh, production and the, cal uh, the cadmium uh, removal uh, capacity. And then it is, uh, yeah, for many people a bit disappointing that when you make a very simple calculation of the clean up time, that it is in comparison to the lifespan of a normal human being, it is quite long. Hmm? Uh, so, um, but I must tell, huh, this is just a calculation based uh, on a short term observation. Uh, here, I will show you from another field site uh, in the same region with higher metal contents in the soil, so 13 milligrams of cadmium and 700 uh, zinc. Um, after eight years of growing um, a, a willow cultivar that is a willow clone that is quite a well accumulator of metals, and then you can see that for cadmium, it's a pity that the color here is not very well visible, but for cadmium, you get after eight years of growing uh, a, a, a decrease of um, the cadmium content, and the same for zinc and for lead. Uh, eight years, yeah, okay, and you remove uh, about one fourth. So in any case, 
we will up and up with a long term. Uh, uh, miracles should, you should not expect. Uh, uh, so um, you will end up with decades, uh, at least with decades. And therefore, it is very important that we um, go to the print. Oops. OK, OK, so it comes back. Uh, therefore, it is very important uh, that um, we, in fact, keep in mind that we are not really doing phyto extraction. Uh, I don't like the term phyto extraction when it is not going fast, because when you say phyto extraction, people expect, OK, in maximum five years, you will clean up the whole thing. And that is not the case. So um, I, I uh, hear quite often uh, sustainable land management that is then probably better. Uh, and uh, of course, the economic valorization of the uh, harvested biomass is a must. Without, uh, you cannot do it. You need the farmers because it, it concerns so many hectares, such a big area in Europe that uh, yeah, you need uh, professionals to do the work and that are the farmers. Uh, yeah, in gold, we also have uh, several field experiments. Uh, I will not speak about it, but uh, I will just show you a few slides uh, and that the plants can get really high. Uh, this is uh, fiber hemp, this is sorghum. Uh, so is growing uh, in Poland uh, more than three meters high. So there is a good biomass production and there is potential for it, but I will not uh, go in detail. Also here, you could, uh, we, we could consider uh, the use of plant-associated bacteria. And that is also something that is investigated at this moment, mainly at laboratory scale, but also already a bit of fields practice uh, was done. So at uh, some bacteria that are mobilizing metals, and in that way, you can get higher concentrations uh, of metals in the above ground parts and the growth of the plants is still okay. Don't try to read this, just to tell you there are interesting reviews available. Uh, people who are interested in more details, just ask me afterwards and uh, I will tell you. Organic pollutants, um, I will try to be brief on it, but uh, I, I, I like this more in fact than the metals. Uh, I will tell you why. Huh? Uh, we, because with organic pollutants, you can really cl uh, clean up a soil in a limited number of years. Uh, there you can say, in five years, I can clean up quite a, a pollution with plants and their associated microorganisms. So we know that most organic pollutants are degradable. And when we just uh, stimulate the microbial degradation uh, in the rhizosphere of a plant, then you can get uh, a quite fast decrease of the uh, metals, uh, of the um, pollutants. So uh, the microbes, they play a very important role here. Uh, so uh, when there is toluene uh, in the soil groundwater, the toluene is uh, attracted by the plant because it is pumping. Uh, so it is consuming a lot of water. So the pollutants are in fact soaked to the root zone and <clears throat> the bacteria that are living there, they are degrading uh, the, the, the toluene uh, and that toluene uh, is then, uh, can be taken up. Well, many organic pollutants are taken up uh, because the degradation in the root zone is not always uh, quick enough. And then you get evaporation of toluene. And that's of course something that you don't want. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, for that problem, we also have a solution. Uh, you can, of course, make transgenic plants, but in Europe, that is at this moment, in fact, not uh, allowed. And it is also more difficult to produce uh, such plants. Uh, and therefore, you can just manipulate a bit the bacteria, manipulate in a natural way. Uh, and uh, so uh, then you have bacteria, uh, they are sitting living inside the xylem vessels of a plant where the water is transported, the water with the uh, pollutants is transported. And what you probably uh, don't realize is that water, a water molecule that is taken up by the roots of a tree, hmm, 
that spends uh, many hours, up to two days before it is evaporated through the leaves. So there is a long contact time possible inside the plant and that allows you to uh, degrade the pollutants. Um, and uh, then uh, the toluene uh, that is taken, uh, that is uh, coming to the root zone, is partly degraded in the root zone, then it is transported to the leaves. And on its way to the leaves, it is also degraded, converted to CO2 and water, and the evaporation of toluene is then very low. Um, why do these um, microorganisms degrade these organic pollutants? Well, some uh, can be used really as a carbon source, carbon and energy source. Uh, and so they are degrading it instead of uh, a sugar. Huh? They can just live with it. Uh, or there is some co-metabolism uh, possible. Um, and um, so these bacteria, we already mentioned, they are assisting their host plant uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, they are um, promoting the growth of the plant, and so the better the roots and also the above ground parts are developing, the better uh, degradation is taking place, but also the more biomass is produced that can be valorized. Um, bacteria are producing biosurfactants, organic acids, and siderophores that are mobilizing pollutants, so it, they are helping the plants to reach these uh, pollutants. And uh, so you can say in the rhizosphere, there is uh, degradation taking place um, that is going quite fast. There is a high diversity of microorganisms, but the contact time is quite short because that plant keeps on pumping, pumping water. Uh, and uh, when there is a high water uh, consumption, then the contact time for these pollutants that are uh, solubilized in the water is quite short. And in the xylene vessels, like I just mentioned, so there is uh, a longer contact time, but there is also a much lower diversity of microorganisms. And thus that has an advantage uh, because bacteria, they are doing the major part of the job and you can there introduce some uh, degraders. Uh, so, I must tell you that at many polluted sites, in fact, degradation capacity is present because many pollutions are quite old. And uh, you know, microbes, they are uh, growing very fast. Yeah? They are uh, dividing. And in fact, you get an adaptation of a microbial uh, consortium uh, to a pollution in uh, a very short time. And at many places, you have degradation. Degradation potential is there. And in fact, you only have to stimulate it. So you can say, OK, we are doing nothing, and the pollution will disappear. Indeed, that uh, can happen. But you can also help it a bit uh, by introducing some, um, uh, some other molecules, like sugars or organic matter. Uh, to stimulate the microbial uh, population, or um, you can uh, uh, plant more plants, and then there is more rhizosphere, and so there is more pollution that is going to the plant. Two very quick examples. This is uh, on a site of uh, Ford, the car producers, uh, they had a leakage of uh, a diesel oil storage tank, and that produced a nice uh, pollution plume. And there we planted, oops, there we planted uh, poplar and willow where it was possible, because uh, on a plant that is working, you have to keep in mind that they must keep on working. Uh, and so we were planting there, and I will show you then uh, two years later. This is 2006. And two years later, you can see the plume was already very strongly uh, reduced. And uh, an advantage is then also of these plants that they are in fact producing uh, a cone in the groundwater. So you get a depression in the groundwater and there all oil, diesel oil is in fact collected together. And then you can also remove it in a physical way. 
So uh, in a few years time, you can reach a very nice result. Uh, and there we, dis uh, we of course did um, a very detailed study. Uh, you can see that these bacteria uh, that they are growing very well on a Petri dish with a minimal medium and just a droplet of diesel in this hole. This is a hole without the diesel, this is with diesel. And you can see the bacteria are very happy. Uh, they grow very well. And we did, uh, of course, uh, a lot of work on it. We studied it in, in vessels, the degradation capacity. We studied the growth promotion capacity uh, and uh, also were checking if there was no volatilization of uh, volatiles. Uh, and it all looked uh, very good there. Um, so a lot of bacteria were present there and just helping them a bit with planting trees that was accelerating, uh, strongly accelerating the, the, the uh, remediation process. Uh, as uh, academics, of course, we want to uh, study things much more in detail uh, and studying a lot of uh, um, uh, characteristics of these bacteria. Uh, this is a uh, just a, a model study uh, using closed vessels, 10 days, and add some bacteria to the diesel. And then you can see that for almost all compounds of the diesel after 10 days, there is a very strong uh, reduction, it's very strong degradation. And you want to know more details and then you study the whole genome. Uh, uh, and yeah, yeah, I'm almost finished. It is almost finished, yes, okay. So uh, then, then uh, yeah, you, you can see there are uh, degradation genes present. There are genes for plant growth promotion present. And uh, so then I just have to tell you some, uh, something about a site where no degradation potential is present. And there you have to introduce a bacteria. And then you can say, what is our Mr. Perfect? Well, uh, the Mr. Perfect uh, in most cases is of course a degrader uh, that has um, degradation genes on uh, its DNA. Uh, it is an endophyte uh, because it is easier to introduce, the, the diversity is much lower, uh, and it is plant growth promoting. And how to construct such, such a, uh, a Mr. Perfect? Well, you have plenty of soil bacteria that, have, that are equipped with uh, plasmids with degradation genes. And um, so you have plant growth promoting endophytes that you take out of the plant you put them together, let them have some sex overnight, and then the next day you have a lot of kids that are able to degrade uh, endophytes that are able to degrade the uh, pollutant. And then you put it back and uh, it works. I'm presenting it in a very simple way, but uh, in practice it is uh, feasible. So this is a, a site polluted with uh, TCE. And it's really the last example that I will show. And uh, so there we studied the, T the TCE degradation and you can see that there is almost no degradation potential, but oh, they are tolerant to TCE. And uh, when you measure then the transpiration of TCE, you see there is a lot of transpiration of, um, TC uh, of TCE and uh, then plant some trees and inoculate uh, poplar trees, of course, and inoculate them with uh, such a degrader that has been constructed in a natural way, yeah? so by natural gene transfer, and um, then watch if it works. Uh, before inoculation, there was also uh, a quite high evaporation of uh, TCE. Uh, so this is the control. This is inoculated with that Mm, the, or the trees that will be inoculated uh, with that degrader. And then you see three months later, there is already much less uh, evaporation uh, of. So uh, you can see that uh, bacteria, they are doing a very uh, good job. You can exploit them um, together with the plant to uh, degrade. And then yeah, you have, of course, to check if the bacteria are present uh, and uh, when you re-isolate them, if they are still degrading, and it all worked very well. And then the last point I want to mention, 
is a big uh, surprise at that moment. That is uh, when you watch then, uh, we introduced a root endophyte, and when we watch then in the stem, in the stem, that root endophyte was not colonizing, but uh, what was happening, natural gene transfer inside the plant. And uh, so you can see that then other bacteria, like free grow bacterium, that is living in the stem of poplar, uh, is taking over these degradation genes and is then uh, completing the job, in yeah. fact. So um, uh, I will uh, finish with, okay, that is just a repetition summary of what I already told. And uh, so I will finish with uh, phytoremediation of organics. That works, it's very promising, it is cheap, and um, um, the take home messages are that a problem can be the availability and accessibility of pollutants for the rhizosphere microorganisms and the plant. Um, uh, what we told about phytostabilization is that it is interesting to apply it, but it is not really uh, um, uh, a uh, clean up method, but together with uh, other um, applications, bio-based applications, uh, it has something to offer to us. Phyto-extraction of trace elements is only realistic for nickel. Yeah. And um, so economic valorizations uh, is, uh, uh, of the harvested biomass is important. And something, some warnings is that uh, with organic pollutants, we must take care with evapotranspiration of the pollutants, um, uh, but microorganisms can do uh, a very the important job. part yeah. of the job. So we still need uh, some yeah. study, of yeah. course, uh, for all metals, for trace elements, uh, for organics, but uh, we are on a good way, but Within 10 years, somebody <laughs> will present during such a meeting, let's say, the outcomes of the studies that are now uh, running. To be continued. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jaco, for a very biostimulating talk. <laughs> but, but excellent. I think you've put, you've put things in a, in a perspective, which is realism now. And I think that's where we're at. We've learned a lot of lessons. We're still learning more, but we're on the way to being able to do some definitive cleanups using these techniques. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, the um, next paper in this session, um, we have Dr. Berian Elberson. Oh, hello. <laughs> right, hello, uh, nice to meet you. Um, and I think this is something which um, has always interested people to the extent of contaminated land and we've seen lots of figures, I think, presented, and I hope you'll be able to put these in context for us for Europe. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jaco, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I felt like being back at university and uh, <laughs> learning a lot. So uh, uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, yes, I'm uh, going to present something uh, really uh, from the other side. So where are the, the polluted sites and uh, uh, the, the, the area extent we are uh, talking about. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, all the co-authors uh, co uh, or um, uh, co-researchers, colleagues uh, that uh, did this work. Uh, so it's really a joint uh, work. Um, yes, uh, we have uh, uh, mapped, uh, or we try to map uh, contaminated lands, uh, and we distinguish uh, diffuse pollution and point source pollution. So uh, diffuse pollution uh, is a pollution uh, that does not have a concrete source, uh, and uh, point source pollution does have a concrete source. Um, so uh, yes, and we have already presented this work last year at the European Biomass Conference. Uh, and here I'm giving a, a, an, an overview of, uh, of, of both uh, uh, results. 
Um, the first is on uh, diffuse pollution. Um, cannot be my phone. <laughs> Often that happens when you're presenting. Um, so uh, what we do uh, is uh, we have to combine uh, the soil properties uh, uh, with uh, the uh, relevant uh, risk uh, limits uh, 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 in a transfer model. Uh, so we have to know what is what pollutions are there, what are the soil uh, characteristics, and then we can uh, map predict uh, with these models, these transfer models, the critical limits and whether these critical limits are uh, uh, exceeded uh, is by combining uh, what is there and what the models tell, tell us in relation to the critical limits. Uh, we do not have a uniform critical limit in Europe for, for pollutants in the soil. Huh? So when do we need to uh, uh, to remediate uh, the, the pollution, but we do have uh, um, the, the end uh, 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 goals. So that could be limits for food, so you cannot produce food on these lands, or for water quality, or for uh, ecotoxicity. Toxicity. Um, so they are the end points, and they determine the critical limits. Uh, and it is very much determinant uh, by the, the soil characteristics, whether these limits uh, are reached. Um, so uh, here you see uh, that uh, the pH factor is uh, very much influencing for certain pollutants like uh, cadmium and, uh, uh, and, and lead. Uh, that the critical limit is, is reached uh, quite quickly. So it's, it's very much influenced by pH while other pollutants are, are less influenced by it. And that is one important soil factor that is very influential. Um, so in uh, gold, uh, we focus on uh, metals uh, for which we have good transfer models. Um, so that is uh, cadmium, zinc, uh, copper, and lead. Uh, because we have the knowledge, we have uh, the models, uh, and we have relatively good data on where they are. Uh, so that is uh, why we focus on that. Uh, the organic pollutants uh, are, are not uh, uh, mapped here, but they're, I just learned this uh, from Jaco that these are really uh, interesting. Well, I'll, I'll come back to, to that because we do identify sites where these different types of pollutants are, are present. Uh, but we unfortunately do not know uh, because the data are not there. But we can, you know, we can find the locations in general. Uh, results. Uh, you really have to look at that. Uh, because this is not really showing a nice map. So you have to uh, uh, yeah, look uh, behind you. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what you see here, the first map shows the cadmium concentration in the soil. That is based on, uh, in this case, on GEMAS, uh, GEMAS data. Uh, and um, then uh, we have modeled with the transfer model, the middle uh, map uh, showing uh, the critical uh, concentration levels for, for cadmium. And then we can combine both. And there you see that uh, the uh, orange and red areas uh, are showing where the critical limit is uh, exceeded uh, in relation to uh, uh, the end point, which is food safety. Uh, so that is, don't think that all these red areas and orange areas are, are really very strongly polluted uh, because we are talking about really small exceedance levels. Uh, but we had to. Uh, so that this is what uh, how it works. Um, what is important to understand is that what we do here is very much driven by data. 
uh, soil data especially, uh, but also the, 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 the data on the presence of the pollutants. Uh, and so we uh, here you see two examples that we used as input for soil, the soil grid information and uh, the Lucas data. Uh, and they really show different uh, exceedance uh, locations. Uh, we are talking about small exceedance levels, but it does influence uh, your, your result. Um, here you see uh, it for uh, zinc. Uh, the same story, uh, but then, yeah, and in relation to ecotoxicity. Um, so, um, yeah, and this is for uh, copper. And there you see really uh, towards the south that you have larger uh, exceedance levels. And uh, this one is for uh, um, uh, lead. Um, and um, yeah, you see that depending on the input data that you use, you, you do see uh, a, a different level. Although the, 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 yeah, the real areas where there is a high exceedance, they come out in, in both um, approaches. So the conclusions for diffuse pollution uh, are that uh, the input data uh, are influential uh, because of these uh, soil data. Um, the critical concentrations really depend on the endpoints uh, that you have uh, in mind, uh, food, water quality, or your environment, your, uh, 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 yeah, your uh, ecosystem. Um, we can well model diffuse pollution uh, for these four metals. And because of we, we have the data, we have the models, we, have, we understand the, the transfer rules to put in our model. Um, and uh, well, based on that, on all these limitations, we can conclude that the exceedance risk of cadmium and also of, of lead is really limited uh, in most places in relation to diffuse pollution. Um, copper and zinc uh, in relation to the endpoint of uh, ecotoxicity uh, has uh, larger areas where there is an exceedance. This is partly related with higher, also natural concentrations of copper in uh, Mediterranean countries in combination with uh, soil factors uh, like uh, pH and low soil carbon concentrations. Uh, for zinc, this uh, applies to situations in, in Poland, Spain, and uh, Portugal. Uh, so that is the mapping of diffuse pollution. And then uh, the point source pollution, which is a complete other uh, approach. Um, there we rely on um, not on models but on uh, on data and combining uh, a lot of data an important source of information for us was the open street map um, and this has uh, geographic objects in it uh, in relation to quarries uh, landfill sites, military sites, industrial sites, wastewater treatment plants, fuel stations. And we said, well, we are interested in areas of pollution that, or potential pollution, that are larger than one hectare, uh, because our perspective is phytoremediation. Uh, we excluded areas that are co covered already by trees or buildings, because then you cannot really grow crops there. Uh, and there are in forest, there are already uh, forest growing on it. So, so we excluded that. So we put an additional layer. Uh, and uh, we relied on a combination of many data sources. And it was kind of a, a stepwise um, search process to, to uh, to find the best way to map the different 
sites. This is an example of the OpenStreetMap tag land use. Uh, it, it indicates where quarries are. Uh, and so uh, this is how it works. It's a lot of data. And uh, luckily, my, my colleagues, uh, Igor Staritsky, he's very good in, uh, in working with very large data sets and uh, analyzing them. So, um, so that was uh, very good. Um, I give, uh, I take you uh, uh, now in our search process towards um, uh, finding uh, landfills, brownfields, and mining sites. Well, the first one uh, is the landfill. In the open street map, we found that the total area is about uh, 100,000 hectares, and we overlap that with green land cover, uh, the category um, uh, uh, dump sites, and we see that they have a strong overlap. But we also saw uh, that the open street map um, uh, identifies uh, landfill sites in other places too. Uh, and the and the reverse is also true that uh, Korean land cover also uh, identifies uh, sites, dump sites that are not in OSM. So we concluded that if we combine both, that we have the best estimate of where the landfill sites uh, are. So that was for for that category, we were relatively satisfied about that we could map it. So we that was a, a good result. Um, now we have the brown fields uh, in uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, and uh, they uh, we saw that um, uh, these can be considered a subset of industrial areas. Um, uh, yes, these types, um, uh, of course, we have much more industrial areas than uh, dump sites uh, and, and, so, and brownfield sites. Uh, so how we have to identify subset within uh, this layer. Um, what we did was uh, that uh, we overlaid with our uh, mask of uh, trees and built up area. Uh, and uh, we combined both sources and that resulted in a total area uh, estimate of uh, 170,000 hectares in the EU and UK. Um, then we have the mining sites. Uh, there has been a, a project, Mintel for EU, that really generated very interesting uh, data set on, um, on mining sites uh, in the EU. But what we discovered was that only a, a, a very small subset of the uh, mines uh, uh, were overlapping with the... Um, uh, open street map polygons. Um, it was also very difficult to make estimates of the area size of these mines. Uh, they can be very large uh, and uh, and you don't know exactly uh, how this has been. Uh, it's it's uh, tagged information, so it's it's very difficult to estimate how uh, uh, yeah how big they are and what total area they cover. Um, so, uh, yes, th this was a first observation. Um, we also saw that the mines in uh, open street map uh, overlap with uh, uh, Korean land cover uh, classes, industrial and uh, sites and quarries. Um, but many mines in mineral for eu database are not identified in the open street map um, and um, what we also see is um, and that is probably to do with that in the mineral for eu uh, data set there are many historic mines uh, that are just covered 
with other land uses. Uh, it was just ignored uh, that that they were there and uh, uh, they, they were just land use change continued. Um, so what we did was that uh, we took uh, we looked at uh, the mineral for EU um, uh, commodity groups uh, that were suitable for phytoremediation uh, activities because we know we have that information in that data set. And we also overlap that with uh, non-irrigated arable land pastures and transitional woodland shrub because these are the land uses that, that you can still convert uh, to uh, an active phytoremediation activity if you think that is uh, necessary. Um, uh, yes, and there was only uh, a limited number of uh, sites uh, of mineral uh, for EU uh, sites uh, that uh, were overlapping with the CLC. Uh, so yeah, the conclusion, the intermediate conclusion for mines is um, uh, that we have these historic mines uh, a lot in this uh, in this data source. Um, that uh, OpenStreetMap and Korean Land Cover they focus on current mines still in operation, uh, so they have another focus. And uh, for more accurate estimation of uh, of the potentially contaminated sites, dedicated databases are required, uh, especially to uh, to identify them uh, well. And the three data sources that we used are really not sufficient to make a good estimate. So that was disappointing, but it is also important to note this, that there is more research required or well research i would not say it's it's a very sensitive issue of course i mean there is of course more information about this at regional and national levels but it's not really uh, that these local authorities are uh ten, well are open to make this public uh, it's sensitive of course uh but we know that that applies to all contaminations uh, yeah um yeah but we we also know eh, that many former mining sites are now agricultural land but they still probably suffer from pollutions eh? and and food is produced on them without really knowing what the pollutants are um yes well what we did uh, see in the that was the last on mining is that uh, with the information that we got from the Minto for EU database, uh, we see that 28% of the mines in the that database are likely to be suitable for extraction of phytoremediation uh, activities, um, and 37 probably for for stabilization. Um, so. Conclusions um, have, uh, on the on the total contaminated site uh, mapping. So the largest areas uh, as pot uh, potential contaminated sites are the military areas, industrial and brownfields, quarries, and landfills. The total area of potentially contaminated sites with land cover types suitable for phytoremediation are. Um, uh, amount to about 2 million hectares in the EU and the UK, and which is uh, a half percent of the total surface area of these countries. Well, the big countries, uh, France, Germany, Spain, and UK have the largest total area of all types, and more than 150,000 hectares each, which is not a surprise, they're big countries. Um, agriculture covers between seven percent in military sites, 20 percent in landfills of the total area. And these areas are, of course, best suited for phytoremediation actions. Um, then um, quarries uh, in uh, OpenStreetMap overlap strongly with mineral extraction sites in Korean land cover. Uh, and uh, but there's also a difference. So uh, we need to combine uh, both data sources, and we identified more than 600 hectares uh, of these sites in the EU and UK. Um, 
yeah, as to mines, I already explained uh, that uh, we know that there is phytoremediation actions uh, possible and also necessary, but it is challenging to really find their their uh, locations. Um, yeah, these were uh, my conclusions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for keeping us time. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Now, we've got 10 minutes in theory. Um, three questions? Three, four questions? Three, four, yes, that's all. <laughs> because it probably made his way to the for yeah. that. <laughs> but perhaps we can direct them uh, to any questions. As you're still standing there, um, please stay. <laughs> but to Jaco and to Maria, there are any questions. Can you please direct them in the coming up? Two questions. Um, good morning. My name is George Papadakis. I'm professor at the Agricultural University of Athens. Um, as uh, Mr. Alexopoulou mentioned this morning, uh, we have a collaboration with Texas a and University in the United States. Mm -hmm. So the question is to Ms. Georgiadou. Uh, what are the opportunities for collaborating with uh, universities and uh, research institutes in the United States or third countries in general uh, within the uh, European programs of research? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. All of the programs uh, of um, Horizon Europe topics are open to third countries, as you know. The question is whether they receive funding or not. So funding is not for free. There are some exceptional cases that the participation is essential and they can receive, but as a general rule, there are some countries that can receive, but other countries that are developed and cannot receive funding. And United States is among those countries that cannot receive uh, funding. Nevertheless, um, uh, as I said, this small exception exists. Other countries like Canada become associated now to Horizon Europe, so they are eligible for funding. UK also returned back to eligibility for funding. And other countries like India, for example, follow a co-funding process, meaning what? They select topics from the programs that they like, and they say that uh, this topic will be funded by X ministry, X department, if we like the, the, the partner or the, the, the uh, proposal that this partner makes. So there is a co-agreement, let's say, with the EU, the European Commission, on topics that uh, this country can uh, co-fund. But that's uh, ad hoc uh, solutions. They, there is not a general. The general rule is that developed countries do not receive uh, funding, and there are others that are, are non-developed or others that are associated and receive. Thank you. Maria. Um, just while you're there, there was one question online um, asking for clarification about the amount of funding available for biofuel research? That's a very general question. <laughs> you have to specify the years, you have to specify the program, you have to specify. Uh, but let's say that uh, a bit for Horizon Europe, until now we have given around 200 million euros in this area. And there will be a little bit, uh, let's say, um, another hundred, perhaps, until the end of the year. But this is all subject to how much, uh, uh, until the end of the program. But this is uh, also subjected to how much budget will be available overall. But there is funding. I mean, biofuels is the third funded area in renewable energy after the um, um, champions of wind and, and solar. So, yes, Thank there is you. funding. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, the three presenters. I'm Rocio Diaz from Imperial College London, and I work mostly with sustainability assessment. And I think that the problem we have normally is that we continue to work in silos when it is uh, addressing sustainability. So I just wanted to ask any of the three presenters, how much can we link this with the new uh, uh, regulation, let's say, from the EU in terms of landscape restoration? and to have like a, a second objective linking it to this biofuel production. 
if I can give an answer from uh, the funding point of view, uh, all funding uh, actually respects the policy framework. The policy framework, in particular under the RED uh, and its revision, the Renewable Energy Directive, sets by your diversity, by your um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sustainability criteria, criteria for the land. Uh, so everything which is produced have, has to respect this, uh, this criteria to be eligible for funding. For funding when, uh, I mean, it is uh, taken up to the national uh, legislation and uh, they become eligible products to reduce the emissions. So they have to respect this criteria. And from this point of view, we finance only advanced biofuels. Advanced biofuels are those that are produced from the feedstocks of Annex 9, Part A, and Part B are the waste-based biofuels. So these are the only ones. And these are, they have criteria about the land, about the forests, about the GAG emissions. So they are all included in, in red. So this is from our point of view. Now, if you talk about uh, synergies uh, with uh, other policies, I totally agree. There's a, there should be synergies between the policies to promote sustainable production of uh, this type of products, not only biofuels, all products from biomass. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can yeah, add something to it, um, but more, um, well, not necessarily landscape restoration, but a combination of that from the nature restoration law because if you look at the law there is really no attention at all to contaminated sites so um well we know how difficult it was to get this law uh, approved and my own government is going to vote against it which <laughs> i'm not happy about um especially because they made changes to the law to make it acceptable and then they still <laughs> vote against it but that is because we have another government now um but yeah contaminate sites are not mentioned at all yeah and that would have been a good uh additional requirements for countries at least to identify these contaminated yeah. sites uh, like they have to focus first on nature 2000 sites to make the uh the restoration uh, measures first and then uh, extend that well logically to also focus on the contaminated sites. and if the new EU directive government would be on landscape okay there i don't know yeah yeah, yeah. so that that's the yeah, yeah. Uh, i also think that uh, this also needs to be uh, related to competitiveness of the eu yeah. industrial capacity, mm -hmm. not just uh, restoration. Restoration is very important uh, for our lives, but it has also to be connected to our uh, economic uh, condition and our position in the world. And I think all the nations in the world, all those that they have signed up to the Paris Agreement, that they think need to think the same way. Mm -hmm. okay. Sustainability is not only environmental, is my point. Yeah. It should be social and economic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much. I think that's, gosh, what a point to finish on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Just one very quick point here. Not too quick. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for all the presenters. It was really good, but specifically to Jaco because I saw my past 35 years <laughs> moving in front of my eyes. I have one specific question for the future. If do you think it's possible for us to work on proteins or phytokeratins that target specific heavy metals in the soil, move them inside plants, move them up in somewhere? Uh, translocated, but only some specific metals. Do you have this feeling or not? Yeah. Yeah. But do you think that in the future we can do something that may for the future, not for now? Okay. Maybe another project.
Thank you very much. We're, we're right on time, so um, we've got a 20 minute break. Um, please be back for 11.10. Uh, so, please take your seats. Ne, ditele. Please take your seats, please. Mi ditele kati. Please take your seats. Please try to take your seats. <laughs> so we have to start. Uh, Hello, everyone. Please, can you take your seats? Please take your seats. Please, please take your seat. Yorgo, we have a very where is Tassos? Okay. So, please take your seat, please, to start. So, Tassos, come here, please. So, okay, we are ready to start the second session. Sorry for being annoying about stop the coffee break. And I would like to invite Tassos. Papas uh, from uh, Texas University now, but before that it was University Costa. Sorry, sorry, Costa. <laughs> so, can you come in front and say a few words about this uh, uh, collaboration with Texas University? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy being uh, here today. Very happy meeting uh, again. Uh, the Agricultural University of Athens working uh, group, Professor Papadakis and uh, uh, his uh, students. Um, my name is Konstantinos Papas. Uh, I'm uh, the assistant director of the Texas A&M Energy Institute. Uh, together with uh, Professor Papadakis, um, we worked on a proposal that focuses on 
the impact of energy transition in um, uh, local communities of Texas and uh, uh, Greece. So um, uh, this is a project that is supported by the US Embassy in Athens. Um, it is something that we were trying to um, achieve the last couple of years. And uh, finally, uh, the embassy uh, kindly uh, awarded a proposal to, to us. The project is implemented since uh, uh, September, uh, last September 2023. Um, two groups of students, uh, 10 students from our side and 10 students from the Agricultural University of Athens are working together uh, on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, they meet online and uh, discuss five topics related to energy transition um, that they have identified. Um, they are all very excited. We are just supervising their, uh, their work. Uh, part of uh, the project also includes um, exchange activities between the two universities. Uh, so last month, uh, the team from AUA visited uh, Texas, the students uh, met in person, uh, it was really exciting um, seeing them working together. Uh, and uh, this month uh, we are visiting um, Greece, Athens, um, the university here in Athens has uh, planned for, um, has a very uh, nice uh, itinerary. Uh, we will visit uh, Megalopolis and uh, the premises of uh, uh, the public electricity company there. Uh, have been meetings with uh, local authorities, local stakeholders. And uh, I believe that it will be a great opportunity for our students to uh, understand, uh, to see a different perspective of energy transition in uh, a European country. Um, I think this is more or less what I don't want to spend more time of, of, of yours, uh, of, your, of your workshop. I look forward to uh, hearing uh, the discussions. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, yes, the project, uh, our project um, ends um, with a final workshop that uh, will take place in, uh, uh, here in Athens at the Agricultural University of Athens. Uh, on 20 and 21 of June. Uh, we expect this to be a quite uh, celebrating workshop, but also um, attract uh, many stakeholders uh, from uh, Greece and uh, the US. We are uh, working with uh, George uh, on uh, organizing uh, this. Um, uh, faculty from uh, uh, the College of Agriculture from our university will uh, be visiting uh, with faculty from Agriculture University of Athens in parallel sessions uh, to discuss a topic of uh, their research interests. Um, the um, outcomes from uh, our project also will be presented. We expect uh, uh, the workshop to attract uh, ministerial officials um, uh, also, uh, stakeholders from, uh, from the U.S., uh, we will invite uh, stakeholders from the greater Houston area that are involved in uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, transition to hydrogen economy. Um, so, those of you that will be around uh, in, uh, on the 20 and 21 of June, you are very welcome to... Uh, join our, our workshop. Uh, we will follow up with, uh, with all of you. Um, this is uh, more or less what, what I have to say. I'm really happy being here among you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Messini will be there and other uh, head of the departments on uh, uh, renewable energy. So, you will see the major uh, department of CRES. Uh, I, so, you will see more tomorrow. Okay. And thank you for today. Good.
Right, well, thank you very much. Um, we can now move into the second session. We've got five presentations in this, so I do encourage speakers to please try and keep to time because it, it will just lose it off lunch. And uh, that becomes sacred, okay? So uh, please um, try to keep to time and I, I, I'll, I'll haul you up if you're really going over. But we are running late anyway, so um, it's not your problem. That was ours. So, Eleni, would you like to come to the floor? Um, one of the home team, as it were, um, to tell us about some fight remediation solutions uh, to growing um, growing energy crops on contaminated lands. I know the work's been going on here for some years now, and Eleni will be the ideal person to present it. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Alan. So thank you all for being here. I would like to welcome you in Athens and in our workshop. Many thanks to EFI for coordinating this project in such an efficient way. Many thanks to the partners involved in the entire project and specifically in Work Package 1, because what I will present now, it is a team effort. I am just the presenter. So, first of all, I would like to introduce you to our uh, pilot fields. Uh, in this uh, work package uh, uh, dealing with phytoremediation, we are four countries from Europe, and uh, we have uh, Poland in the Upper Silesia area. We have uh, France in uh, close to Lille. Uh, we have uh, Unibo, Italy, uh, close to Bologna. Uh, in Greece, we have two sites in uh, central uh, Greece, in, Ath in Lavrion, and also in the northern part of Greece, in Kozani. Uh, we are very pleased to have two uh, overseas partners from China. Uh, it is uh, Hunan province, the Institute of Bast Fiber Crops. We have them with us here. Thank you so much for coming. We have also the Hunan University. Unfortunately, Yazir was not able to, to get his visa. And also we have uh, India. First of all, I would like to introduce you with the crops that we are working with. We are working with four energy crops, with the sorghum, the variety bulldozer, with uh, hemp, the variety Futura 75. These are annual energy crops. And we have two perennials, Miscanthus per giganteus and sweetgrass, the variety Blackwell. When we were preparing the proposal, we decided to work with these four crops because they are high yielding and they give biomass that it is uh, very good for bioenergy purposes. Also, they are relatively tolerant to contamination because you can imagine if they were sensitive to this abiotic stress, we were going to have failure in our uh, experiments. And also, they have relatively low agricultural requirements, which is also a quite important parameter. So, uh, we are working with uh, uh, different uh, treatments. First of all, we are testing biostimulants and more specific protein hydrolysate, uh, which from now on will be called B1 treatment, with fulvic and humic acids, the B2 treatment, also with mycorrhiza, and the combination of mycorrhiza and protein hydrolysate, mycorrhiza and fulvic humic acid, and of course all this against the control. So we had to deal with six different treatments. Uh, as Effie mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have decided from the early stages to follow all partners the same protocols so that we could have some comparable results. But as you can understand, if we are going to apply six treatments for four crops and some replications, our experimental field would be quite big with a lot of effort and a lot of budget, much more than we had. So we decided to accomplish the first step to do a pot trial for this reason and to test the, the crops and the treatments and to uh, decide which are the two best treatment per country and uh, to use, of course, a control. So we took uh, soil, we transferred soil from our contaminated sites to our premises, each partner separately, so that uh, we'll, we will test uh, like a, a real condition uh, of soil. 
And then we did the pot experiment. And here you can see some pictures. I don't know to take, uh, want to take a, a long time for that. And the result of this first step was the, uh, present, is presented in this table. Uh, it was uh, very good to observe that uh, treatment uh, B2 and mycorrhiza, that means full vicumic acid and mycorrhiza, was the treatment that were best for all partners and for all crops. So we decided to use this treatment as a common one for all of us. Of course, each one has a control and each partner, depending on the crop, um, we decided to, to use, to apply one more treatment. For example, for Poland, for Miscanthus, the treatment B2 was the best, while for uh, Aua, for Miscanthus, the treatment of mycorrhiza was the best. So now we will uh, travel a little bit along our fields. First of all, we will start with Greece and with the experimental field of the Agricultural University of Athens. This is situated in Lavrion, in Lavriotiki Peninsula, which is uh, uh, in, uh, in Attica prefecture, where we are now. This is a picture from our field. The source of pollution here is uh, mining and metallurgical activities, primary of, uh, um, of uh, silver and lead ores that goes back to the ancient time goes back to 3000 BC and then a more recent uh, activities uh, in the 1864 to 1982 when all the activities mining and metallurgical activities stopped at the area. As you can see this is a multi-metal and extremely high contaminated uh, site uh, with yellow, I have, uh, I, I have added that how many times our contamination is higher than the normal values um, according to Cabada Pedias in soils. This is a layout of our experiment that you can see here. Uh, this is the sorghum plantation hemp plantation and miscanthus. Miscanthus, this picture was taken um, early uh, in, the, in the, here it is with a drone. This was taken in the first year uh, and miscanthus is still very small because it is the year of establishment. And here are the, the results concerning the yields that we had. I will, uh, I will present only a few of our uh, results uh, due to time limits. So, as you can see here, the yields did not differ significantly among treatments, apart from hemp for 2023, as you can see here. So, the second observation is that in the second year of our experiments, we had higher yields than in the first year. Uh, for, for perennials, this is usual, but for annuals, this was something surprising, but also something that was observed in other partners too. Uh, hemp gave higher yields in control plots. That is also an interesting observation, but remember this because I will come back later. And sorghum gave higher yields in the treated uh, plots. These are the heavy metals and antimony concentrations in the aerial biomass uh, of our plants. And uh, you can see all the metals and antimony. As you can see, both crops could concentrate a quantity uh, of the metals in their aerial biomass. But among the two crops, hemp and sorghum, uh, hemp could accumulate more nickel, copper, lead, and antimony, while sorghum could concentrate more cadmium and zinc. And now we will go to our second experimental field in the northern part of Greece in Kozani. This field is established in uh, Meta premises. Meta is a, a private company uh, mining uh, lignite uh, in an area of 2.7 square kilometers. In this site, nickel is the main contaminant and uh, the concentrations of nickel were uh, above 10 times higher than the common usually found values. And this is uh, a layout of the experiment in, in uh, the, our field in Kozani. These are pictures taken from a drone. In Kozani, we had sorghum, miscanthus, and sweetgrass. In Kozani, it was the only field where we, we were able to, to establish sweetgrass plantation for several reasons I can explain later on. 
And here are the results of the dry matter yields. Uh, as you can see, uh, the highest biomass yields were recorded in the, in the combination of mycorrhiza and protein hydrolysate. And the yields of sweetgrass in the second year was double when compared to the first year, year while for miscanthus or four times higher. At this point, I would like to point out that uh, our experiments are not uh, ended. So we are still, we have still uh, field trials. We are still continuous our measurement and our analysis. So I'm, what I'm presenting today is what we have so far. So now we are moving north and we go to Poland. Uh, in this uh, site, uh, we have a contamination due to an all metalliferous waste dump, which uh, was operated uh, since the uh, 19th century. And the main contaminants are uh, zinc, lead, cadmium, and arsenic. This is, this is the, the old waste dump, and this is our experimental field and the layout of our experiment. This is our field. And, uh, and here you can see uh, the results of the, of the yields. Uh, as you can see, uh, the treated crops gave higher yields than the control ones. And in the second year, again, the yields were higher than in the first year, apart from, from hemp for the treatment B2. Here are all the metal concentrations in the aerial part. Uh, all uh, crops could concentrate um, an amount of uh, of uh, metals in their aerial uh, biomass. And uh, in, in the second year, the concentrations were lower than in the, first, in the first year. And here are the metal removal. Uh, I will come back to this uh, in the, later in my presentation. Uh, what is the metal removal? It's the grams of the heavy metal of each element that can be removed from the soil with the cultivation, and it is uh, grams per hectare. And these are per year. So this can help us to figure out, uh, depending on the concentration that we have, in how many years we could have a reduction of 10, 20, 50 percent of our contamination. But as you have seen from Jaco's presentation, to, to Mediterranean, we go to Italy. Uh, this uh, field is in uh, Chiarini 2. Uh, it is located near Bologna. This is a formal uh, illegal landfill where uh, they used to deposit waste of various origins. This is a, a picture uh, from uh, our field there. And the main contaminant are copper, zinc, but also organics and more specific PCBs. This is the, um, the yields. Uh, as you can see again here, we have the, the, the strange thing that control uh, plants gave higher yields than the treated ones for hemp, while for sorghum and miscanthus was the opposite. And these are the hemp metal concentrations. For uh, sorghum and miscanthus, the analysis are still ongoing. And as you can see, uh, both uh, crops could uh, uh, take uh, copper and zinc in their uh, aerial biomass. So now it's time for France. France uh, is, uh, our field is uh, situated in the north of France, close to Lille. Uh, this site was contamin is contaminated by cadmium, lead, and zinc. It covers a huge area of one 120 square kilometers. And uh, the contamination source was the metallurgical activities of uh, lead and zinc smelter Metal Europe, NOR. This is a, a picture, uh, a figure of uh, our uh, of our experimental plot, which is here, and this is the metal layer of NOR. And as you can see, the main contaminants here are cadmium, lead, and zinc. These are two pictures of uh, our from our field of sorghum and hemp, and the experimental layout here. As you can see, Miscanthus uh, was not successful in the first year, but uh, our partners are going to establish uh, uh, Miscanthus again this year. For the, the failure was for several, mainly climatic and irrigation uh, reasons. 
And here are the results of the yields. As you can see, no significant differences were determined between treatments and um, the yields of, of sorghum and hemp were much higher in the second year. And these are the metal concentrations in suits. Uh, no significant differences were observed between treatments, but as you can see here, for cadmium, especially for cadmium and for zinc, hemp could concentrate much higher uh, amounts of these metals in the aerial biomass it, when compared to, to, to hemp, sorghum concentrate more. Yes. So, this is a quite interesting outcome from our experiment so far. As I explained to you before, here you can see the uptake of each element in grams per hectare and per year. We have the, the, uh, the four metals and the antimony. Antimony is a metalloid, that's why I'm, I'm referring to this separately. And uh, so, what are the, the outcomes of this? That both crops could remove metals and antimony from the soil. That is the first important result. The second result is that sorghum was more efficient than hemp in the contamination of polluted soils, especially for cadmium and zinc. And that is logical because sorghum uh, produces much higher biomass than uh, hemp. Please note these figures here. Look in hemp. In hemp, we, are, we have, in several cases, higher concentrations in the control plots than in the treated ones. While for sorghum, all the higher uh, uptake, uptakes were observed in the treated plants. What can we result from this? That for hemp, lead, zinc, antimony, and copper were ex extracted from the soil more in control plots, and that, and that means that the biostimulants that we used were not so uh, effective uh, in increasing the phytoremediation potential of hemp, while the opposite was observed in sorghum. The biostimulants we, ha we have used were very good, have a very good impact in the phytoremediation potential uh, of, uh, of sorghum. And uh, general uh, results that if we are going to establish a phytoremediation plant, what we have concluded so far is that we would suggest sorghum than, rather than hemp to, to be cultivated in our sites. Of course, this is not the only reason that we would uh, propose one crop. We should take under consideration the final needs, the markets, the logistics, the potential uses, and all this uh, could, could uh, give us which is the best uh, crop. But from strictly phytoremediation point of view, sorghum is better than hemp. And this is my last slide before I start to, to shout. <laughs> so, uh, in our work package one, in the phytoremediation, we, have, we will gather all the results coming out from uh, our experiments. Uh, also, along with Michel mentioned that is an honor for us to have him in our consortium. Along with Michel, we are going to gather also all the literature uh, um, papers, uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, phytoremediation of specific crops and our metals, and also results from other ongoing and recently finished projects in order to develop optimized phytoremediation solutions. That will be released at the end of our project in the form of report and fact sheets per case study. So, all this data will feed World Package 3, which, <clears throat> which uh, um, our partners are working in War Package 3 will, uh, uh, will use several models in order to estimate, uh, at least to have a first estimation, not, not be so strict, uh, a first estimation at European level of the contaminated areas that could be remediated, the feedstock quantities that could be produced in this, from these contaminated sites, and finally, the relevant quantities of the biofuel production. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much, Eleni. It's interesting to see that 
um, you've got the message, I think, that it is important to, to um, carry out field trials for more than one year, <laughs> because yes. the differences between years could be very important. Mm -hmm. And the difference in behavior, it's not just the weather conditions, there are yeah. certainly some differences there. So it um, does underline that basic principle. We need to go f several years mm -hmm. every time. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. So, so now can I ask um, next speaker, Dr. Snezna Baletic from uh, Novi Sad um, to present again another, I think will give us some more insights into the same sort of arguments there. So we look forward to hearing them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello to everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and present all uh, results also as a, as a, as a teamwork. Uh, for phytoclimate project. Uh, I'm Snežana Maletić from University of Novi Sad. Uh, so I will in the in the in front of our team present uh, what we did uh, in our project. So the concept uh, is similar uh, uh, actually for all three projects. So we are uh, growing uh, different plants on contaminated land and producing biofuels and bio coke in our, our case for metallurgical industry. So uh, here I will present actually what we are doing uh, inside of our phytoremediation studies. And at the moment uh, we have four pilot sites. Uh, one is in Argentina, uh, one in Serbia, one in Lithuania, and one in uh, Spain. Uh, regarding the contamination, so Argentina, it's mainly, so it's its mining site, it's, it's contaminated with uh, metals. Serbia, it's combination of metals and uh, organic pollutants. Uh, Lithuania and Spain are contaminated with organic pollutants. Uh, all results, uh, so this is, uh, in our case, this is work package two. Uh, this is central work package where we do all our phytoremediation studies and all results which we obtain during these studies are actually information which we feed into other work packages uh, for production of biofuel and bio coke in work package three. We will uh, hear more about it uh, in the later presenta presentation of Christopher. So uh, also information are uh, feeded into work package four for uh, ass uh, environmental assessment and social sustainability for commercialization and uh, for legal aspect assessment. Uh, so I will uh, also go side by side. I will uh, start with Spanish, uh, Spanish pilot sites since they are our uh, work package leader. Uh, I already said that the main contamination uh, in this site are actually uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, and uh, this is site inside of petroleum industry. Uh, this is concentration measured uh, during the previous investigation before start of the project, and this is concentration of initial characterization of the start of the pilot site investigation. So there is a lot of heterogeneity of the site, but on some cases we have very high uh, concentration of petroleum hydrocarbons. Uh, so regarding the work uh, that has been done uh, on this pilot site, so all pilot sites actually have some series of um, pot experiments to establish uh, plant species which will be used on pilots uh, and for further investigation of uh, phytoremediation mechanism and to better explain the results which we uh, obtain during the uh, uh, work on the pilot site. So uh, in, the case of <coughs> in the case of Spanish pilot site, they also provide some pot test experiment and up to now uh, we have two realized um, season on the pilot site uh, so regarding the, uh, I will maybe show it on the next slide. Uh, regarding the sum of the results, uh, they have uh, all of the pilot site have some control pl plots, of course. And uh, in Spanish site, uh, the uh, pilot was divided uh, based on the concentration of the total petroleum, petroleum hydrocarbons. So uh, here are actually results uh, during the, these two growing season. And we can see maybe for the last season that there is 
no differences in plant height uh, compared to the control parcel. So this is some figures from the, from the pilot site I forgot to mention regarding the, uh, the pilot site. Uh, Brassic anaphos or rep seed and sorghum were chosen uh, for uh, testing. So this is results from the uh, first and the second season uh, regarding the removal of total petroleum hydrocarbons. So as we can see that they are removed not only from the contaminated site but also from the control sites. And at the moment, colleagues from the Spanish uh, testing uh, additional, providing additional pot test to actually better explain the results which they obtained here. Uh, regarding the uh, biomass production, uh, actually, so uh, biomass production was uh, on the satisfactory level even in most contaminated sites. So here are actually results for contaminated parcels and for the control parcels. So the next one is Lithuanian pilot site, also contaminated with petroleum hydrocarbons. So this is former oil base and uh, during the removal of the uh, old uh, oil base, there is some leakage. So uh, source of pollution is from year 2009 and concentration of the pollution. So these sites are also uh, very heterogeneous, so concentration are different on the whole pilot sites. That uh, that's why this pilot site is divided in the three parcels based on level of the contamination. Uh, <coughs> regarding the pot experiments for selection of uh, plant species for pilot site, they tested amaranth, uh, Jerusalem artichoke, and different herbaceous mix. So all of these are actually then transferred to the pilot site. This is uh, just short, shortly results from the, uh, from the pot experiments, where we can see that there is significant removal of petroleum hydrocarbons. So this is results from the pilot site. Uh, they actually here use different um, amendments to the soil, bacterial, mineral fertilizers, and uh, compost. And this is results regarding the biomass, biomass output uh, during the first and the second growing season. So there is a big difference in the yield, not, uh, not only because uh, of the better performance, but some lessons are learned in the first growing season. The, there is the more dense sowing in this second growing season. So this is also one of the reasons why the they got uh, better output of the bio biomass in the second trial. Uh, regarding the <coughs> removal of the uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons, so where was actually these herbaceous plants, there was the highest concentration of total petroleum hydrocarbons and of course the biggest removal, but also uh, removal was notified also with uh, lower hydrocarbons range and other, uh, other plants. So what was uh, actually conclusion here? Uh, that this site, of course, is still contaminated and that more cycles are needed for complete removal of petroleum hydrocarbons. So the next site in is Serbia. So in Serbia, here is the, the site is contaminated mostly with heavy metals. So this is copper, chromium, lead, and zinc. And in some cases, cadmium, I, I will add now here as well. Uh, there is also some level of total petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and some organochlorine compounds, but on, on the low, low level. Uh, what is actually specific for this site, it's not uh, soil, it's actually uh, dredged sediment from the river Chanel. So the contaminated sediment was dredged from the Bege Canal and it's landfilled next to the river bank. Uh, one part of the sediment was dredged uh, eight years ago and uh, the next one is dredged actually during the project. So we have 
two parcels which we treated during the project. Uh, for selection of the plant species, uh, which will be tested here, so this is the first spot test, we test different plant species, rep seed, sorghum, white master, sunflower, and hemp. And based on the, I will not go into the details here, but based on the, these results uh, for the pilot site, uh, we choose rep seed, we also tested different plant promoting rhizobacteria, which didn't get, uh, uh, get us a better actually removal or, or plant production. And that's why uh, on our pilot site, our pre uh, only rep seed was applied without any soil amendments. Uh, also, uh, what is actually shown during the, uh, during the uh, first spot test, uh, also during the uh, remediation on the pilot site, that the most limiting factor we already heard, it's availability of the metals in the soil. That's why we also additionally tested how much metals we can extract by changing the pH and applying different uh, low molecular organic acid and also acid fertilizers and its combination. So I will not go into the details since we do not have much time. Uh, regarding the uh, next spot test, which we done, uh, it's aimed to select plant species for the third growing season, since we cannot grow the same uh, species uh, several years. Also, here we test hemp and sorghum and uh, test uh, how much we can extract with addition of uh, organic, uh, organic acids. And uh, the similar as the in previous presentation, uh, sorghum has bet better be accumulation factor and bi biomass output. That's why it's chosen now for the third growing season. Uh, so this is how it looks actually on our pilot site. So this is before the start of the project. This is the first growing season with rep seed, and in the second growing season, beside the landfill one, we also have uh, parcels with uh, fresh contaminated sediment, and this is how it actually looks until the uh, end of the second growing season. So regarding the results, what was interesting that in general, we have better of a production of the biomass or biomass outputs from the landfill, actually two with the fresh sediment. sediment. And uh, regarding the sum of the results, it is uh, interesting to mention here that these sediments is slightly alkaline and that after the first growing season, we have slight change in the pH. It was lowering down. And that's why, for example, here are presented results regarding the availability of the metal, uh, which is going uh, or more exchangeable and more available fraction are actually detected in the second growing season. And of course, in the fresh sediments uh, as a consequence of pH changing. And here are, for example, uh, translocation factors. And I will just maybe point out that for the fresh, freshly contaminated sediment, freshly dredged sediments, they are much higher and much higher bioaccumulation bio factor is detected for fresh uh, dredged sediment. Uh, regarding the organics, so I just presented here uh, results from total petroleum hydrocarbons. Removal ra uh, rate is about 30% and for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons about 70%. So I will not, of course, read all of this, but what is the main conclusion uh, for the pilot site? Availability of metals is the problem. We notice uh, increase of this availability in the second season and that the fourth, third season, uh, the, instead of rep seed, there will, there will be actually sorghum for the third growing season. Uh, the last pilot site, is Argentinian, I would say maybe the most pro problematic one uh, because of high concentration of metal uh, and metalloid uh, inside. So this is the former mining site. And the problem is also that there is some communities living next to this pilot site. So the concentration of 
heavy metals are in range actually in gram per kilogram, so that's why it's so problematic. And uh, in this case, uh, regarding the pot test and re regarding the plant species which are chosen, so they choose uh, natural shrubs and trees which already grow on this area and also uh, free quinoa varieties. They do some acute chronic uh, exposure test uh, on contaminated uh, soil and also on soil con contaminated soil amended with dolomite and compost. Uh, it was necessary because uh, the high level of concentration of these metals and also because of low pH of this soil around two. So for example, uh, this is results of this test, uh, control one and contaminated soil without amendments. And when amendments are applied, uh, actually uh, the good performance of the plant was achieved. They also uh, have two uh, pilot sites, one with lower and one with um, one with less, which was less contaminated, and one with higher level of contamination. So uh, they applied uh, soil amendments, uh, such as dolomite and compost, in order to maintain plant growth. Uh, since uh, there is actually different climatic zones, uh, here uh, the first uh, harvest is done in January 2023 and second in July. Uh, mostly for the quinoa crops. Uh, so more results of this, uh, this research are actually published in this paper and this is my last slide. I hope I was in time. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so I've recently started at Teesside University, but I'm still doing one day a week at Strathclyde yes, as well. So that does count. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Anyway, Thank you. Um, Rich is going to tell us about to work with the grass, um, weed canary grass, in fact, something which is a very productive grass that we know and um, does seem to be a potentially very useful grass. So Thank you, Alan. Uh, so name check for the, the Strathclyde team, uh, which I'm leaving now, and also for the other Ceresis Work Package 2 partners who all contributed <coughs> to this talk. And um, a bit about the Ceresis project, because I'm the first of the three speakers talking about Ceresis today. These are our technical work packages. Work Package 2 is the one I'm involved with, growing energy crops and phytoremediation field trials. We produce contaminated biomass, which is then subject to conversion by the <coughs> technical work package three, um, task using supercritical water gasification plus pyrolysis, and then the final technical um, work package is decision support system. So the, the idea and the strategy of, of this was that we would use perennial grasses for stabilization, and by that I really mean mechanical rather than chemical stabilization. And um, <laughs> the, the hypothesis was that if we had uh, low uptake, high biomass species, we would get the maximum energy production and income and minimize downstream processing issues by having a lower concentration, uh, but also maximize the offtake and beneficial use of the site, so maximize the offtake of contaminants. So the, um, these graphs have, have changed a bit, but they are hopefully can you can still get the information from them. This was based on the Bioregen Life project where we grew uh, th three energy crop species, Phalaris, Miscanthus, and uh, Coppice Willow, Salix, on the same Brownfield sites for three years. And basically we got three times, uh, sorry, two orders of magnitude higher um, concentrations of uh, amounts of biomass from the reed canary grass. So much more productive, but the concentrations of contaminants were higher in the, the other species. So there were lower concentrations of of, uh, that should be zinc, actually, the highest bar there. The scale's gone. So zinc was the, the most um, prevalent contaminant on these sites. 
But if you, because the uh, biomass production was so much higher for phalaris, the actual removal of metals per annum was, was higher. So we think this is a win-win-win. So sorry, Effie, that's one more win than for the, for the gold project. Uh, so maximum energy, minimum contamination and economic penalty, and the, also the phytomanagement management environmental benefits of reusing these sites. So the first thing we did in, in Ceresis was go back to the bioregen sites. I was at Teesside University before, which is where I planted these sites as well. So that's really complicated. Uh, and the, the, the dots in color are the dots from 2020, 2021. And the, the uh, black and white ones are from 20, 2004, uh, 2010, the original trial establishment dates. These are perennial crops. They haven't been managed in between. They haven't been harvested, I should say, after the first two or three years. Uh, but you can see that the, the problem we had was that the, compared to the box, which is the, the limits of contaminants in copper and zinc for domestic biomass fuel pellets, the, the uh, levels in the coppice willow were, were, were exceeding the, the limits. And surprisingly, after 15 to 18 years, depending on which trial site it was, uh, the contamination levels were pretty much the same in the, in the willow and still exceeding those limits. Uh, so the, the new trials in Ceresis are in four countries. In, in Scotland, where we've grown phalaris. In, in uh, Ukraine, where we've grown phalaris and miscanthus. And then in Italy, where we've just grown phalaris. And then in Brazil, where we've grown four different uh, suitable, climate suitable perennial grass species. So this is the whole list of, of species that we've used or uh, had access to in in the Ceresis project, the ones in, in bold were the ones we planted. And you can see that the, the Brazilian uh, trials, the pictures at the bottom show the, the Penicetum purpureum and the um, Capiasu grass, the Brazilian version, which have, have been compared with sugarcane and energy cane, uh, saccharin. Mm. So going to each <coughs> set of trial sites in turn, the Brazilian ones mm. were areas impacted by chromium, but also nickel, first of all for mining, then uh, manufacturing use of explosives, and then finally from the application of, uh, yes. of tannery sludge, chrome contaminated tannery sludge to land. And that's where the field trial was. And there's a, a picture of the field trial at the bottom, recent one, you can see the, the penicetum, the, the purpureum on the right, and the, the green capiasu grass in the middle, head and shoulders above the the saccharum species, and there's a table of uh, yields and chromium concentrations from the first year of that trial, and not much difference in the chromium uptake, much lower than in the soil, so it's phyto exclusion, but there's a big difference in biomass productivity, so the penicetum was, was clearly a winner in terms <coughs> of the offtake, uh, the amount of metal extracted. So moving on to Ukraine, the Ukrainian trial is just west of Kiev and narrow and planted in um, 2021. It was narrowly missed being uh, invaded by the Russian advance two years ago and survived and was been, has been harvested since. And it's an area where there were fuel and pesticide spills from agricultural use. So it's a contaminated agricultural land. It has HCA isomers, which are lindane, and also some organometallic uh, pesticides, including antimony. So I've got data for antimony there, a couple of hundred parts per million antimony in the soil, but in the, uh, the plants, we were getting a couple of hundred um, parts per billion. So uh, again, phyto exclusion of antimony. The Italian sites are around Viterbo and the University of Tisha. This is an area where there's, there's active volcanic activity and high concentrations of arsenic and other metals from that volcanic activity. The brightly colored map on the, the bottom right is the concentration of arsenic in groundwater, which has been transferred by irrigation to the soil and geogenic dispersion. Um, so the concentrations of arsenic in the soil and in the uh, root canary gas are, are quite similar, but still lower in the re canary gas than in the, in the soil. So again, we're looking at phyto-exclusion. 
So in the UK, what we wanted to do was go as far as we could to the extreme levels of contamination compared to the original bioregen project demonstration sites, which have been brownfield sites and not particularly contaminated. So we, we went for mine sites and we've got uh, two areas on a, a mine site in Northern England where something like uh, um, a percent levels of lead and zinc. One's richer in lead, one's richer in zinc. This is a heterogeneity in a single mine site. And then on the right, we picked a new site in Scotland where we had up to 10% metal in lead and zinc um, in, the, um, in the mine soil there, in the tailings. We used compost, you can see, to establish the sites. This was something, again, taken from the Bioregen project. And in particular, we used compost blankets this time. So spreading the compost on top of the soil rather than incorporating it so that we could hopefully reduce the dispersion of this activity to, to minimize it. We had to use bagged compost for the trial, but obviously you could do that in a more sustainable way using um, loose compost for full-scale deployment. We did it by hand uh, uh, in just after the pandemic. And the, uh, the results we had were, first of all, we've managed to successfully establish uh, reconnect gas in just something like half a centimeter of, or a centimeter of compost on spread on the surface really challenging site. This, this particular site is subject to very exposed conditions and sheet flood. And one of the things we observed was that once the reconnect grass had grown, the root mass had established and stabilized the compost. So the pictures at the bottom show the, the, the roots exposed by, by sheet flow. So we we're already getting this mechanical stabilization even after the first year of growth. But, but we also noticed that there were um, quite extreme and variable concentrations of metals in, in the biomass from this site, from an earlier project. And we could see when we were harvesting that actually the biomass was dirty. There was, there was grey dust trapped within the, the biomass that looked like mine, um, mine dust and tailings material. And um, we used um, X-ray computed tomography to look for high-density particles from this lead waste and you can see hopefully that there are some concentrations on unwashed biomass, not so much, but not com completely em uh, eliminated on, on the washed biomass. This was washed with concentrated hydrochloric acid and then 10% laboratory tween detergent, 30 seconds each with an inter in intermediary uh, water wash. And a bit more detail, we, we looked at the density, we tried to calibrate this to actually identify what sorts of particles we had in there, whether we had mine contaminated particles or whether we just had silicate soil particles. And you can see that the, the density corresponds to, to sericite, which is the, um, the lead carbonate mineral. Um, and the, the particles are trapped in the culm of the plant, so where the, the leaf joins the stem. So this is a, an architectural issue for the for reconeograss, perhaps, if the leaves are still attached, which seems to be the case when it's not mature or, or doesn't establish well. Um, and unfortunately, we even after this extreme washing, so this is concentrated hydrochloric acid and con strong laboratory-grade uh, glassware detergent, we still couldn't remove all of these high-density high, uh, particles. So we're clearly getting crossover into the, the, the washed biomass. So if you look in the, in the literature, there's a whole, um, very often people don't say how they washed the biomass or what the mm -hmm. chemicals they used or how long they did it for. They just say biomass was washed or, um, or some, sometimes actually it's not mentioned. So we're, specifically we've analyzed biomass that we've specifically said isn't washed. Uh, but I wonder, have phyto extraction studies possibly overestimated yeah. plant uptake? So that's quite a pro provocative thing to say, but particularly if you think of hyperaccumulators with small, complex geometries on very highly contaminated mine sites where there is dust blowing around, which is in turn extremely highly contaminated with metals, this could have a, a, a significant impact on the, yeah. the um, amount which is perceived to be within the plant. Uh, so we've done a few further washing experiments to try and follow this up, to try and work out what proportion of metals is on as opposed to in the plant. And we used the uh, ground biomass samples that we had from these trials because we don't have very much material. And we did a simple washing in a, in a centrifuge tube. 
taking the, uh, the property of the ground biomass as being hydrophobic, so it floats, in other words, so we washed it for a minute. We had to use uh, a combined wash of HCL and tween here, uh, and then we analyzed the float and sink components of the, of the biomass. And we've got something like a quarter of the level of metals in the floating plant material compared to the settled washings. So silly, clearly some of the material is coming off, but the residual washed biomass is still quite contaminated. And there's a nice little SEM picture at the back, um, at the bottom here, showing one of these particles in a washed piece of, of, of biomass, and the particle is really embedded in the plant. So you, you're almost never going to wash that off. So finally, the, I remember that I mentioned this new Scottish trial in um, something like 10% combined metals in the, in the soil. We've got two fairly small harvests of Reconero gas off this, this site now. And we've got something like 1% total metals in the unwashed biomass in year one and about the same in year two. So provocatively, I'm going to ask, are these the highest recorded levels worldwide in an energy crop species? Uh, hopefully somebody will correct me at this point. I haven't seen any higher levels reported today. I haven't spotted any on the slides that have been presented. Um, so that's a lazy way of finding out if that's true by asking you all. Uh, the, the yields, on the other hand, are really very low. So I've seen much higher yields reported today for different energy crops. These are in tonnes per hectare. And we're looking at something like um, two orders of magnitude less than we got on the brownfield sites, where you typically, for UK, you get five to 10 oven-dried hectares per annum from an agricultural production site for Reconero gas. So we're getting quite low biomass levels, but very high um, con concentrations of contaminants in the biomass. What does this all mean for the actual offtake of, of uh, contaminants? So, a bit complicated these graphs, but the top ones are the year one and year two concentrations of metals in the, the biomass. They are not quite consistent across years. Mm -hmm. There's some reduction, but not, I wouldn't say there's a consistent reduction like was being shown uh, in some of the other uh, work today. Um, and they, one thing they do reflect is the concentration of metals in the, the soil. So if the, the lead's higher in the soil, then lead's higher in the plant as well, because this is unwashed. So there, at the bottom, you can see the, the offtake. And these are in grams per hectare per annum. Um, so for, for year one and year two something, so something like a few hundred grams per hectare. So that's pretty much what we've seen today, but some of them were, were up to kilogram, I think, weren't they? Um, so interestingly, I'm going right back to the beginning in the trial with the with bioregen and the less contaminated brownfield sites, we had much, much higher uh, biomass production and much lower contamination levels in the biomass, but the annual offtake was pretty much the same, around about a few hundred grams mm. per hectare. So we've, we've taken it to the other extreme, much higher concentrations, much lower biomass, but we still haven't won, really. We've still got about the same. So my money would be on brownfield sites rather than very highly contaminated mine sites for deployment and rollout of this because you're going to get more biomass. So what do we know is Ceresis ends? Ceresis wraps up at the end of, end of next month, possibly, um, officially, and... Phalaris is a, is a viable high biomass, low contamination uptake energy crop species in, in Scotland, <coughs> England, Italy, and Ukraine. For those last two, we needed irrigation to establish it because of the site in Ukraine, but because of the climate in Italy. Generally low uptake, so it's a phyto excluder for arsenic, antimony, and chrome in geogenic and anthropogenic contaminated soils in Italy and Ukraine, but much higher levels of cross-contamination in these highly contaminated soils in, in Scotland and England. We think from dust blow and rain splatter mm. because these sites are unvegetated. So maybe that issue will decline as the sites are stabilised and revegetated. As we saw the nice pictures of the, the Euro smelter site with revegetation, perhaps they will stop <coughs> that dust blow and reduce that issue in the future. <coughs> So the biomass contamination level and contaminants reflects those in the soil, which is, which is logical. Uh, 
and it's extremely difficult to valorize by washing. We haven't found a way of doing it. Certainly wouldn't be uh, economic to use concentrated acids and, and detergents like that and then dry biomass again to, to use for combustion. But we think it's still potentially, valorous can be used as a, a source of low ILEC biomass for, for marginal lands, especially former landfills and brownfield sites and maybe more contaminated sites too. Uh, so it's a sustainable biomass source for sustainable biofuels and good for phyto management, but possibly not for phyto remediation through phyto extraction. So that's that's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. I think you've raised several points there, which we ought to have in discussion at the end. But uh, I'll save that my own work for that. Thank you. <coughs> Now, um, the next speaker, Giacomo, he's here, all oh, right, yeah. okay. And a little bit more about bridging the gaps, which is the main theme of, of gold. So um, we look forward to hearing about this, your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hmm. I am Giacomo Talluri from Polytechnic of Turin and Record. Uh, I am the Work Package 3 leader. And this work has been prepared with the help of the other uh, task leaders. So CRES, uh, Lisbon University, Imperial College, Wageningen University. Okay, first of all, I would like to provide you with some information about uh, the World Package 3 activity within Gold Project. And then we will move to uh, check some results from the Lavrion case study, from the analysis of the value chain based on the Lavrion case studies. Just to quickly move, uh, as you have already seen this morning, uh, Gold Project has uh, as main goal uh, the um, exploitation of phytoremediation activities in order to uptake uh, pollutants from the soil and into the biomass, and then convert the biomass mm -hmm. into biofuels and bioproducts. Uh, Work Package 3 basically puts together all the information from the other partners into a modeling of a value chain uh, which uh, will provide the possibility to assess uh, the techno-economical and sustainability performance. And uh, the, let's say the main building blocks that we are using is uh, regards uh, first, uh, soil and, uh, and pollution, basically. And the data for that comes from our test field site activities from Europe and also the one from extra European countries. Then, as uh, Eleni already explained really well, uh, the other uh, information that we use uh, to model the value chain are uh, related to crops and treatments. And finally, the last uh, big step uh, block that we are using uh, regards the conversion pathways. Uh, for Europe, we are considering three different conversion pathways that uh, link together an intermediate conversion process, such as torrefaction, <laughs> Uh, tor wash droparolysis, <coughs> together with uh, a gasification and syngas fermentation final step. Then, uh, thanks to the Canadian partners of the University of Sherbrooke, we, are, we have also another uh, conversion pathways that uh, regards uh, autothermal pyrolysis and uh, fish trop synthesis. Okay, so you have seen that we have many, many, many possible configuration of the value chain. So we decided, I'm sorry that it's uh, a little bit uh, change the, the format, but uh, just to say that we now narrowed it down our possible configuration by considering just uh, uh, the best performing crop in terms of uh, uh, both uh, um, crop yield and pollutants uptake for each of the case study. And uh, we also developed the evaluation model uh, that uh, takes into account all the, let's say, all, all, the, all the phases of the value chain. So it starts from, uh, from um, the agricultural part, uh, and then it considers the conversion pathway, the final use, and also uh, the logistics. Okay, after this really, really, really quick review of uh, work package three activities, we can move to, to have a look uh, at our case study analysis. And, uh, I would say that we will, uh, today, we will focus on two conversion pathways. One is uh, uh, slow pyrolysis plus gasification, and the other one is trefaction uh, plus gasification. And um, 
Okay, let's move on. Um, it will be a techno-economical analysis, uh, strictly focused on that. Uh, let's start from the site description. Okay, uh, Eleni already explained perfectly uh, what we are talking about, so I will be really quick on that. Uh, the Lavrion wider area uh, is, uh, is a mining site, has been a mining site for a long, long time, and has been also a smelting site in recent times. So unfortunately, this led to extremely high soil pollution. And this pollution can be found, of course, uh, in, the field, uh, in the field site, but also in other, many other uh, places uh, in the wider area. So to make things short and maybe have more time for the results, uh, we uh, used sorghum for this value chain because it resulted as the best performing crop. As you can see in the blue bar chart for in terms of crop yield and also in terms of uh, overall pollutants uptake. Okay, so uh, we need to model also the, the, the conversion pathway. So in the next slide, you will see some, uh, let's say, fact sheet about uh, uh, each of the, of, the, of the plants that are involved in the, in the, in the whole uh, uh, conversion pathway. So we start from the slow pyrolysis. Uh, the plant was modeled as a rotary kiln type using uh, operating in inert atmosphere. And uh, basically, it is a small plant because it has uh, 900 kilograms per hour of uh, biomass input, as you can see in the, in the central box. And uh, the biochar yield was set at 32%. Oops, sorry. Okay, set at 32%. And uh, all the pyrogas, the rest is pyrogas. And basically the pyrogas is used, is burnt, to provide for all the heat needs of the plant. And the flue gases, are uh, modeled to be used in external ORC power generator, covering all the electrical power needed by, by the plant. All the data has been provided by our record partners. And uh, you can see financial and economical uh, uh, parameter used in the right uh, table. Um, talking about uh, the fate of the pollutants, uh, preliminary analysis has been carried out by our package two partners, and they've shown that uh, uh, arsenic, nickel, and lead are expected to remain in the solid fraction, while cadmium and partially zinc uh, is expected to, be, to move in the, in, the, in the gas phase. Moving to the refaction plant, uh, we modeled it uh, still as a similar sized plant, so a small one, basically. Uh, TNO provided all the information about technical and economical data. Uh, we expect a 60% share in mass of, uh, of torrefied biomass yield. <coughs> and uh, basically, uh, the torrefied ga torrefaction gas is used to provide uh, the energy for all the heat need of the plant. Uh, fate of the pollution, pollutants uh, evaluation uh, show that uh, arsenic, nickel, and lead are expected to remain solid, while still here, part of cadmium and part of zinc are expected to move in the gas phase. Finally, the last piece of our uh, conversion uh, pathways is the final step, the gasification and syngas fermentation plant model. Basically here, uh, mass and energy data were provided by TUM. Uh, this is quite bigger plant, of course, and um, uh, it has, uh, is considered to have uh, a chemical input of 9.5 megawatt of uh, biomass into the gasification phase. That can be translated into roughly 1,600 kilograms per hour of terrified biomass or 1,300 uh, kilograms per hour of biochar. And we have as many as many output, ethanol, and then a basket of other products such as uh, acetic acid, butyric acid, butanol, hexanol, and a small fraction of hydrogen. Mm. We integrated the, the material provided by TUM with uh, techno-economical data gathered from literature especially from a big model prepared by NREL, uh, mainly to find out the, da the information needed to, for the financial and economical part, and also to, let's say, try to set up a simple integration and power generation sector needed to cope with the important electrical and heating power needs of this plant. 
here, of course, uh, the pollutant fate is expected to be mostly in the vitrified ashes slug. Okay, so we have seen each of the single pieces of the, of the conversion pathway. Let's try to put them together. Uh, first thing that I want to say is that we considered here a decentralized uh, situation. So we have a central gasification and fermentation unit and then several distributed uh, trefaction or slow pyrolysis units. Um, this also to take into advantage uh, of the better distribution across the, the, the geography. Okay, so the gasification and single fermentation plant is bigger, so it would need more uh, intermediate plants, around three trefaction plants or four slow pyrolysis plants. This depends uh, to the fact that the bioshard yield is lower than the tre trefired biomass yield. Uh, so you can see in the figure that uh, uh, the full scale, uh, full conversion pathway would need between 20,000 tons per year to 30,000 tons per year, depending on the, on the, on the, on the conversion pathway uh, of uh, dry sorghum as, as an input. And uh, if we translate uh, this amount of biomass into, let's say, uh, an amount of land that is needed, and this should be land to be remediated uh, using the 30 tons per hectare per year of sorghum yield, you find that the full-scale um, conversion pathway would need between 650 hectares to 1,000 hectares of, uh, of land to be remediated, from which take the biomass while the, the, the single uh, intermediate conversion uh, plant would need between 220 and 240 hectares of, uh, of land. Uh, just to put things into, into context, if you consider an area covered by a 10 kilometer radius, uh, such needs for the full scale uh, conversion uh, pathway would translate into a share between 1% and 3% of the total land. Okay, we have defined how much biomass we need, but then we have to understand when this biomass is available across the year. And so with the great help of the World Package One partners, we defined for each case study a calendar which provided the biomass availability. <coughs> and you can see here the results for the, the, the Greek case study. So you can see the sorghum is available only two months a year because these are the harvesting months basically. And if we put together a mix of all the, the analyzed biomass, we still have a gap that cannot be seen here of between four to six months in which biomass is not available. Uh, so it becomes clear that uh, either we need to consider storage, preferably the centralized at field level, mm -hmm. or we need uh, to consider integration with other type of biomass, possibly not polluted, or both, of course. <laughs> Uh, then, coming to the results of the, of the analysis, first of all, you can see in the table here uh, the expected amount of pollutants uptake. From left to right, you can see, okay, uh, the, here is missing the measuring unit. It is kilograms per, uh, per year, basically. You can see that one hectare is, uh, uh, can provide uh, these amounts of, uh, of uh, pollutant uptake. Then if we consider the land needed by one intermediate plant moving to the right, we can see which is the, the uptake expected of pollutants from the soil. And then the last block regards uh, a full scale conversion pathway uh, with, with the torrefier or with the slow pyrolysis. We can see that the amount starts to grow uh, because we are considering between uh, uh, 650 and 1,000 hectares for the last two, two, um, two columns. Okay, now moving to the, to the final slides, uh, considering the technoeconomical assessment of the value chain, here we can see uh, some uh, general data and uh, a brief explanation of the methodology that has been used. So we gathered from literatures uh, data about uh, the market price, current market price of the outputs. And also 
we gathered information about biomass cost at Farmgate, which for sorghum was set as 50 euros per ton dry matter. We calculated transportation costs both for raw biomass and intermediate biomass, and intermediate uh, products. Then moving to the, to the methodology, uh, we defined a two-step cascading methodology. In the first step, we considered the gasification plant and uh, we calculated the maximum price for the intermediate uh, material to be bought uh, by the gasification plant in order to reach minimum business viability. Uh, when I talk about minimum business viability, I consider net present value of the plant to be zero at the end of its lifetime, basically. So this is the maximum price that I can pay for the intermediate. Over is not business viable. Then we move to the, to the um, intermediate plant and we use this tentative intermediate price to evaluate their business viability, to see if they can sell it at that price or if they need to sell it at a higher price. Okay. Let's see the last two slides. Here we have some quantitative results and uh, some takeaway messages. Basically from the calculation, the, here, okay, here there is a typo, sorry. It is the maximum purchase price for the intermediates is set uh, at uh, 220 euro per ton for the biochar and 180 euro per ton for the terrified biomass. Oh, here you have to think that the higher this price is, the better is the business is the business viability for the value chain. Then we also considered a price uh, a sensitivity analysis of plus minus 15% on two economical parameters. One is capex and the other is the output market price. Oh, really interesting is the fact that the output market mm -hmm. prices uh, as example for the ethanol or for the other bioproducts has a really really high impact on the output, on the, on, the, on the maximum purchase price uh, for the intermediate. And this is of interest because if, as an example, ethanol can configure as fit as, as an advanced biofuel, uh, you can have the, let's say, the driving force of mandates and, uh, and targets set by regulation. So the price could increase because there is a need for it. And also it is important to understand that uh, CAPEX have a high impact, and this, since the, this is a low TRL, TRL overall technology, uh, there is uncertainty on the value of CAPEX, so we have to carefully consider it. Oh, finally, moving to the intermediate plants, uh, we have seen, I have to spoke a word of advice here. We are considering really, really small plants. So basically, uh, let's say their economics are less favorable. As an example, for terrified biomass, this value could be viable uh, for bigger plant. But now we are considering small plant decentralized. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, these two values that we have found for the gasification and that are used as, uh, as, the, as the sale price for this intermediate plant uh, do not prove viable. They, it's, it's too few. We need to pay more for that. Then take into account what I have said, if uh, we are considering, uh, uh, let's say, that, that, uh, that the biofuel is fit to be an advanced biofuel, probably this price could increase because the price for the biofuel would increase as well. But no worries. Uh, we still can hypothesize uh, uh, to get a premium uh, since we are avoiding remediation activities, substituting them with phytostabilization action that will be put into place. So if we consider to, let's say, define, uh, uh, link this premium to, to the land size and thus define it in euro per hectare, uh, basically we find that its minimum value to reach business viability is around uh, 2,500 euros per hectare per year. So uh, as a comparison, uh, consider that conventional remediation activity could reach cost of 700 euros per hectare. So overall, uh, in a 20 year period that we consider as a lifetime for this plant, it can be an interesting alternative and it can be a viable idea for a premium. Oh, I finished? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you.
I think you hit on a number of issues there, particularly the continuity of production of biomass, which I, is a serious problem. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, well, in the last paper of this session, um, thank you. We've got uh, Professor, Professor Athanasios, um, who is, um, again, uh, local, <laughs> um, and it's good to hear from you. And you have got a, 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 looks like a very interesting presentation here, just about how you support the decision making. And um, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so we're continuing on the value chain and decision support on value chain um, topic. This is, uh, I should mention that this is a joint work between uh, National Technical University of Athens and uh, net company Intrasoft. So I would like to acknowledge uh, all the, um, the members of the team for the work that I'm going to show. Um, I will uh, elaborate on what Giacomo said before. So uh, decisions on how to design uh, biofuel value chains are very complicated and for various reasons. The first one is that there are several stakeholders involved. So we have uh, feedstock producers, which are in many cases farmers or uh, asso farmer associations, cooperatives. Then we have the biofuel uh, producers, which produce the biofuel precursors in many cases. We also have the upgrading facilities, which are usually refineries, who produce the end product. Then we have intermediaries in between. We have logistics providers in some cases, which are different than the other partners. And all of these stakeholders have different requirements. So they, they want different things, they want different questions to be answered. So this is, a, and they have different objectives. Secondly, what Giacomo also mentioned is that we have seasonality. Most of the feedstock that we have available, especially if we're talking about either agricultural waste or um, generally whatever is produced in agriculture is seasonally available. And to make the economics work, you have to, if you have an expensive facility, it has to work for a, a, a big time window, a long time window. And this is a, um, a trade-off here, and there is a contradiction how to achieve that. Uh, so how do we mitigate that? We either pre-process and storage biomass, and, but storage has a cost, uh, or we use commercial available feedstock, which again has been pre-processed. And all this impacts the logistics costs, and of course, uh, logistics are quite expensive uh, in these cases, so they make it or break it in some cases in the logistics costs and the efficiencies. When we're talking about phytoremediation, uh, to buy a fuel value chains, things are even worse. It, it gets even more complicated. Why? Because we have more stakeholders involved. We now have the contaminated land owners who may not even be the farmers. Uh, so they have a vested interest. We also have policy makers. We have uh, local authorities that may have a, a say in that. So even more stakeholders to, to take care of. Uh, the contamination impacts the biomass yields and, uh, and, and what types of biomass are, can be grown in that land as we saw earlier in the presentations. Uh, the land availability is not the same as in traditional biofuel production because contaminated land is not so uh, large. You usually have sparse land availability or in small plots or specially distributed. And this le leads to lack of economies of scale. Again, as Giacomo said, you need smaller plants if you're going to treat that uh, separately, unless you mix it with normal biomass. Uh, so this is another issue. And finally, contaminated biomass might even require different technologies, as we're going to see later on, in order to separate the contaminants from the biomass uh, during the, the conversion process. So decisions are complicated. Mm -hmm. And this is a slide with overall uh, service assumption objectives. I'm not going to cover the first and second because uh, the first one was covered already by Richard. The second one is going to be covered by uh, Nikos later on. Uh, the aim is the same in all three projects, uh, how to, um, to, to develop and assess and, and uh, validate integrated biofuel production pathways that will produce clean biofuel, uh, biofuels uh, from contaminated land. <coughs> and I will stick to the objective <coughs> three, which is to provide decision support for various stakeholders uh, in order to achieve win-win solutions uh, to the contaminated land while producing uh, clean biofuels. This is just a, a picture of uh, the, the services partners. We also, apart from the European partners, we have uh, Canada and Brazil who are contributing to this project. And this is, um, yeah, you should be seeing a green, uh, green figure to the right. So this is not green, but this is the decision support pillar that I'm going to focus on. Uh, the decision support work is, uh, is fed with data from the phytoremediation trials within the project, which is the top left 
uh, box and also from the technological uh, partners who are doing the work on the bottom left. And to the right, we have the, the, the decision support work. And this means that we collect the information in terms of uh, biomass growth um, uh, and crops and harvest methods, and also on the conversion and separation technologies. We embed that in a model that I'm going to show you a little bit more information about uh, later on. We use some advanced techniques like uh, machine learning, for example, to do some uh, estimations. And we perform an analysis of various pathways uh, within the same uh, model that have to do with uh, life cycle analysis, uh, so environmental KPIs, social KPIs, economic KPIs. And all this is fed into a multi-criteria model that ranks the various options that we have, essentially. So this is the high level view of, of the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, this slide we have um, at the top, we have a, a, a series of stages in the value chain of, uh, of uh, biofuel production, starting from mm -hmm. the left, which is the upstream part of uh, energy crop cultivation and moving to, <coughs> to conversion, moving to um, the final upgrade of the, uh, of the intermediate products to the end product and finally the end users. <coughs> so the idea in this work of Ceresis in the decision support work was to cover the needs of stakeholders that are involved in all the value chain apart from the last box, the end users. And uh, this is also shown in the exploitable results part. So the original aim was to be able to satisfy the, the questions and the requirements of stakeholders that belong into pretty much the whole value chain apart from the end users. Um, and there's many different uh, stakeholders with different requirements included in all these stages, as you can also see here. <clears throat> so the, moving into um, the, the kind of decisions that this tool is aiming to support, we frame those as questions rather than decisions. So the, the first one is which biomass types are suitable for particular contaminated land conditions? And this is mostly relevant for uh, upstream uh, uh, involved stakeholders, but also for uh, policymakers and uh, local authorities. <coughs> then the second is uh, which are the expected yields and contaminant uptake if we use different biomass types in those particular conditions. The third one is moving on to the technology, which combinations of biomass types and technologies are suitable in these particular cases that we are interested in. The fourth one uh, expands that into the supply chain and how could we optimally design a supply chain? Uh, and by design, we mean which, fa which facilities should we use, what type of facilities, in which locations, which capacities, and how should the overall structure of the supply chain look like? And this question is answered in economic terms, so which is the most effective uh, supply chain design in terms of economics? And the fifth uh, type of question is what is the optimal value chain configuration overall? So this has to do with combining everything from upstream, the, uh, the uh, biomass species or types, technologies, and supply chain structure. <clears throat> and finally, to assess these value chains in terms of uh, sustainability dimensions, including all of them, economic, uh, environmental, and social. So these are the six types of decisions, let's say, or six types of questions that the decision support system aims to answer. Uh, here I have some of the key characteristics that we had in mind when designing this, uh, this tool. The first one is to allow full value chain assessment, as I showed before, uh, so reaching the stage just before the end use, rather than a partial view, which is more common in these types of tools. The second is to include the sustainability, the three sustainability dimensions in the assessment, so not just the economic one, which is the typical one again, for good reasons, of course, but we wanted to expand that. Because, of course, doing phytoremediation is not all about economics, okay? We, we know it's not going to be uh, comparable to traditional biofuel production, so we need to consider what are the benefits in terms of environmental and social impacts. The third one is to adopt different approaches, novel methods, in terms of predicting the performance of biomass species on contaminated land. In our case, we, tried, we, we are using machine learning, so it's a different approach than, uh, than the typical approach that we, uh, we, we can see. And this is mostly to assess the yield and contaminant uptake. Mm -hmm. The fourth one was mm -hmm. to create something that is a practical tool that uh, the stakeholders mm -hmm. can actually use. And this translates into requiring little information from them. And this is contradictory, of course, because if you ask for little information, mm -hmm. then you have to do assumptions. 
but this is a trade-off uh, we were looking at. The fifth one is to keep it flexible enough to support the needs of various stakeholders in the value chains so that it can answer different types of questions. The sixth one was uh, the geographical scope to be uh, all of Europe, so to be able to apply that in the whole of Europe rather than in specific uh, locations. The seventh was to introduce the learnings from the Ceresis project in this, in this tool. Um, that was quite tricky, I must say. Uh, the eighth one was to be modular and expandable, so if in the future more knowledge <coughs> is generated, we should be able to update that with the new knowledge. Uh, this is a practical one, the ninth, so the user should be able to save the scenarios they've uh, looked at so that they can do comparisons and refer back to previous work. And the last one is a novel concept. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, mobile fast pyrolysis facilities. Uh, of course, you win something and you lose something. What you win is in terms of uh, logistics and transportation with mobile facilities, because instead of transporting generally loose material, which is biomass, you can transport bio oil, which is much more dense and also more storable. Okay, so uh, this is the benefit. The drawback is higher cost because you lose from efficiencies. There is a certain size that you can reach. Uh, it's less efficient in terms of economics. Because in uh, contaminated land, you usually have sparse availability, you have more transportation. And this is why this concept was investigated, and it's included also in the decision support system as, as an option. And this is a figure of the, uh, the flow of logic. Uh, I don't have a, ah, here's the pointer, sorry. So I have a pointer. Uh, we start from the user inputs. We require generally little input from the, the user, but the, the minimum required input is the, the plots of land that we are interested in. So there's a map, as I'm going to show later on, where the user introduces the fields or the area that is contaminated. Uh, they need to provide some information about the contamination, uh, some information about the product prices, the end product prices. Uh, most of the costs that I mentioned here and technology characteristics are already embedded in the model, so the user does not necessarily need to introduce this information. So this is the trade-off I was talking about before to make it practical, but uh, introduce some assumptions. So once the user has completed all this information, then there is a machine learning module that runs uh, um, in the backstage and it gives options to the user. So the options uh, are which biomass types seem to be feasible for this particular location and which not. And for the feasible ones, it gives an indication of the expected yield based on previous knowledge that we had in the, uh, in the, the, the project. So we trained the models and they provide this information. And then the user can select which biomass types are of interest. So based on this selection, we can move on and then we combine the technologies at this stage, there are two technologies, as Nico is going to mention, super, supercritical water gasification and fast pyrolysis, but the model can be expanded with more technologies in the future. And it combines those with the biomass types that the user has selected. And some of the combinations will be feasible, some of them will not be feasible. At this stage, the model continues with the feasible uh, combinations. You cannot see the arrows here, so I have to show them. And then it moves into a list of scenarios for optimization. And here the user can also select whether they're interested in looking at the mobile facilities option or not. Uh, the problem here is that there is some uh, computational cost, so the user has to go for a coffee and come back if they choose the uh, mobile facilities. They have to wait a bit. Uh, and then there is a supply chain optimization module where we optimize the supply chain structure for each one of the combinations, which we call pathways. So there are many running in parallel, and for each one of those we optimize the supply chain based on a number of uh, economic KPIs. The output of this uh, optimization is a series of KPIs, not just economic. We also have outputs in terms of energy requirements for the supply chain, the full supply chain, uh, some environmental KPIs and so on, mass balances for all the combinations or scenarios that I mentioned before. And then we run LCA, social uh, KPIs calculations and the economic KPIs. They all go into a multi-criteria decision analysis tool where the user has to select their weights or their priorities and based on that we end up with a final ranking of the options and therefore the user can uh, can see a ranking of the options so they can select the most the best one for their particular case and their particular requirements mm -hmm. so this is the overall logic of the decision support tool the key elements that we are including is the machine learning for the biomass suitability that i mentioned before the technology suitability assessment that comes after that that combines it with the biomass suitability. 
the supply chain optimization module, the life cycle analysis that is performed, the social impact assessment, and the multi-criteria analysis. So these are the building blocks, blocks of this decision support tool. So as the work progresses and the flow progresses, we're answering different, of the que different questions that from the ones that I showed before. Okay, so here there are some, uh, um, uh, some shapes here, some uh, ovals that show which user story, we, we've called that user stories, different users have different stories, uh, which user stories are covered in each stage of the decision support tool. Now, I should mention that this is not finalized yet, so it's not public released. This is a pre-version, uh, so it's not finalized. I'm going to show only a few things. Um, this is the stage of fields import. The user can draw the fields essentially in different shapes, so it's either a polygon or a circle. We are also now introducing a, a, a functionality to uh, add coordinates. So if you have the coordinates, you can import a file, for example. And you, essentially, you draw the area that is of interest. <coughs> So this is the first thing that the user sees. And then once this is, is done, we move to a, a stage where we need to import the data about the contamination. So uh, because we don't have a database that this could be drawn from, the user has to import that. And we have different types of contaminants, uh, heavy metals and uh, uh, organics, and some basic data about the soil, soil characteristics. So it's mostly the soil texture, uh, organic matter content, and pH. And based on that, the process begins. So I'm not going to show results yet because it's not finalized. Uh, but the logic generally in this tool is that we create scenarios. Scenarios are essentially combinations of feasible biomass types and technologies. Okay, so each technology with a biomass type is a scenario. Many scenarios can run in parallel and move on. <coughs> and this is a, a, a small glimpse of the results. There is much more than that um, that we will be available when the tool is, uh, is online. So generally speaking, for a set of scenarios, as I mentioned, we get three types of KPIs, economic KPIs. So these are essentially our KPIs. There is a set of economic KPIs, a set of environmental KPIs, and a set of social sustainability KPIs. Um, the multi-criteria assessment is performed, and this is the multi-criteria part. So essentially, the user uh, defines the significance of the various KPIs in a scale from 1 to 10. And they also have to give us a weight on how important is the three dimensions, economic, uh, environmental, and social, for them. And based on that, there is an assessment of the scenarios, and you come up with a, a ranking, or here it's a, it's a graph of the ranking, which is the preferable one, and so on, of the combinations that we have investigated. Uh, we get much more details, like uh, cost and revenues breakdown, um, uh, the emissions from transportation, for example, uh, or the transportation legs. Uh, all that can be found. The life cycle results are also available. And the supply chain design, which is roughly what you see here at the bottom. Uh, the figures, are, the, the icons are to be changed because uh, this little factor essentially is a storage space. And this fire is the, um, the, the plant. We're going to change them. They're not so nice. But this is uh, how it would look like. So you will understand what needs to be built where. And if you press on these icons, you can see more details about how big this facility is. Uh, what is the role, what kind of facility it is, uh, coordinates, and so on. So this is a small glimpse of uh, how it's going to look like. Uh, after we finish that, we will apply it in four use cases in the countries that you see here. Uh, so the UK, Ukraine, Italy, and Brazil. And we're going to show some hands-on uh, application uh, within the project. And of course, it's not all, uh, uh, all easy to do. Uh, we have a vision to achieve with this decision support tool, but there are challenges. The first challenge is that this is an ambitious tool because of the scope. It's a wide scope in terms of uh, the value chain. And this means that we had to do simplifications to keep the complexity low and also to keep it practical if the, the users uh, are different stakeholders. The second is that we cannot avoid some key information to be input by the user. So the primary concern has to do with um, the contaminants. We're not sure how easy it is for someone to know the contamination levels in the soil, but without that, we cannot do anything. So this needs to be imported by the user. The third uh, concern is that because we use machine learning, this works better with uh, larger data sets. And unfortunately, there are no large data sets available at this stage. Uh, we had some data from within our project, but it is limited. Then we looked into the literature and we found that there is not so much published in photoremediation. 
And not even that, what is published is not systematic. So uh, there are different protocols followed, different, uh, different aspects of results presented. So that it's not very easy to put everything in one group, let's say, and, and use it for machine learning because you have different types of results. And finally, there are no, uh, not so many long-term trials. There are very, very few. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, it's difficult, for example, to understand what is the, um, whether it's a linear relationship between the time and phytoremediation and the extraction, let's say, of, uh, of contaminants, or if it's an exponential or something like that, which has troubled us a lot. So the science is not mature enough to be able to support uh, this uh, in some cases. And finally, the last challenge we had is that uh, these projects, including Ceresis, are uh, TRL 4 to 5, so the technologies are at uh, low TRL level, but to make this tool practical, we had to upscale. So the results that this tool should present have to do with high TRL levels. So we had to find ways to move from, to bridge this gap, let's say, we're using this word a lot in this uh, today, to bridge the gap between the TRL level of the project and the decision support tool, which must be practical and therefore refer to high TRL levels. So these are the challenges. Yeah. And I would like to thank you for your attention and also mention that in April 23rd, which is a Tuesday, we're going to have a, a, the final event of the project in Thessaloniki. And you're all invited to attend that. It's going to be hybrid. So you can either come to Thessaloniki to our, co our partner, CERTH, who are going to host the event, or you can, can attend online. Uh, we will uh, publish that soon when we have the final details. So please uh, uh, keep an eye on that. 23rd of April. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. That's e excellent. Thank you. Um, well, you've managed to keep the time very well as well. Thank you. Now, uh, we've got, we must have time for just three questions. I can see one hand, and I know that hand. Yep. <laughs> right. Michelin <laughs> from Nirai in France. Uh, just a small comment about the efficiency to remove metal, metalloid, and the organics. In fact, we are, we are not targeting the total content, we are targeting the biovaluable fraction. Of course. Especially using on proxy like extractable with uh, salt dissolution. Yes. Or, and at times it is organic, especially organochloride. And I give you my, of course, Richard was perfect mentioning that we cannot, we are also summing up the diffuse contamination. We, we are not washing the uh, shoe when we harvest. No. And I give you my skill about long term filtering. I have 18, yeah, 18 uh, yes. years of harvest uh, in some of the site. Uh, we were producing about copper and uh, uh, PAH. In the case of copper, you are rapidly reaching a difference of seventy-five percent of bioavailable copper. But after that, the removal is remaining very low because the, you have just a small resupply from the very place. But you, you cannot remove the other part because it's bind really bind to the uh, old organic matter, and it's like the onion. You can remove. You can remove the former uh, skin layer, but what is trapped, deeply trapped, in the deep microporosity in the H matrix, you cannot remove. And it is the same with the organic. Yes. I'm working with gel cleaning. You can remove using cucumber, especially zucchini, but you can remove up to an amount. After that, the gel cleaning is, or PEE also, is really strongly bound to the organic matter, you cannot remove. But we don't care, yeah. because in fact what is important is the polyphon linkage. So what is really joining the pathway, the exosome pathway, and targeting the biological receptor. Another point it is about the ecotoxicology. Remember that when we are a growing plant, we will in habitat, and we have to take care that it will be colonized also by wildlife or Yes. yes. Very good point. And I, I would just add to that one thing that I don't know is considered or not is what's in the roots, and do are the roots harvested? <laughs> Probably not. So you're adding. You're not looking at real uptake. You're looking at 
what's in the top and what is bioavailable, as you say. And, um, you know, it's somewhat spurious to think that way because there's the whole plant and what's happening to that. And does that then act, just keep this material in the soil? Does that get, does it get biodegradable? Or as you say, does it just get locked in organic material? I mean, these are still unknowns, but they're things that we have to bear in mind, particularly when we think about figures for uptake. It, it worries me still. Sorry, I shouldn't go on, but anyway. Anybody, time for one more quick question. Good day. Hi, I'm Raul Kamsakar. I'm from the Texas A&M Energy Institute. Professor, if you tell us, I'm assuming that a model, a supply chain model, is a mixing input for that. Yeah, I guess. So is the selection of the bio, uh, correct bio, <coughs> uh, how plants will grow, embedded in the supply chain model? Or could it be shaped by a machine learning model for the selection of power tools, and then the supply chain is uh, designed around that model? Thank you, Ken. So first, the user selects the, the plant gives you options. When you select which options are good for you, and you move on. So the, the, the model runs multiple times. Okay. So every different biomass gets selected. So at least one possible combination for running one scenario. Exactly, yeah. So you might have many times for the gun. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Yes, didn't see that one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just uh, wondering how the effective rank analysis of the data model compares to your DSS model. If, uh, of course, you adopt the same technology, the same combination of uh, biomass, biomass, or whatever, data model, do they converge? Get an educated uh, very good point. Uh, we don't have the final results in our case because we haven't uh, applied it. We're building it, which is it's close to completion. Uh, but it would be very interesting. The, the only issue is that we have different technologies than what Giacomo is using. So if we apply the, 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 the parameters that Giacomo has done, we could do that. We could see whether we're converging or not. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think we need to see more. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. the validation for your DSS. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Fine. Well, I think we must finish there um, in order to keep to some sort of time scale. Anyway, thank you very much to all speakers. Um, done, had a very interesting session on the, on the techniques. And this afternoon, the third session is more on just conversion. So um, well out of my field, but um, I shall look forward to learning more myself. Thank you very much, everybody. So we've got a, a lunch break, theoretically, till 2 o'clock. OK, thank you. <laughs>
<clears throat> yeah, it's a, it, that's exactly what it is. So we heard a lot this morning already about uh, the gold project and uh, and what we're doing there. And now Nicholas and I are going to talk about um, the different routes for converting that biomass uh, into bioenergy. So I'm going to talk about route one. And this uh, was already mentioned. This is where we uh, pre-treat the biomass upstream of a gasification process. And we have three uh, pretreatment uh, processes that uh, Yakimo already uh, mentioned. And then uh, Nicholas is going to talk about uh, the second route, which is uh, autothermal uh, pyrolysis. So we've already heard a lot of background about the gold project and what our objectives are and why we're doing it. And of course, we're growing these energy crops on contaminated sites, uh, metals contaminated sites, and then we want to convert these into clean biofuels. So we're looking at two different routes uh, to convert them, as I had just mentioned. So this is what the first uh, route looks like. So you have your uh, biomass in the, oh yeah, you can see it. In the, there's three pretreatment processes, and then there's the gasification, gas cleaning, fermentation of the syngas to, to the biofuels. And I'm really going to focus on the pretreatment. I'm not talking about the gasification. We don't have those uh, results yet. I'm really going to be talking about um, what we can do to the biomass before upstream of that uh, conversion process. And those are the four um, energy crops that we're working with in gold, as already mentioned, the hemp, the sorghum, uh, miscanthus, and switchgrass. And just a note, so we all get, uh, we all get samples of, of these uh, feedstocks that have been harvested and dried and chipped by the partners and they send them out to us. And then we all in our labs uh, analyze them for uh, different metals concentrations. And this is just to show that when you're measuring uh, well, any, anything uh, in low concentrations, uh, in, in, some, in a sample like this, your results can vary. So that's just uh, something to keep in mind we're looking more for trends um, and not necessarily absolute values because it's such a heterogeneous uh, a sample. Um, you're, you're taking a very small subsample of, of a plant or of, of, of this biomass and you're analyzing it for a metals concentration. It's, it's, uh, it's obvious that you're gonna get different results uh, in different, uh, from different samples. So just keep that in mind. So as I mentioned uh, at TNO, where I work uh, in the Netherlands, um, and with the record in, in Italy, we're looking at three different pretreatment options. So really the goal of pretreatment, um, we want to upgrade the biomass. So that's to, um, for example, most of the time when we upgrade a biomass, we want to increase the energy content or increase the heating value. Uh, so it's, it's a better fuel. Um, and in the case of gold, and when we have a metals contaminated biomass, we also want to, um, we want to see where those metals end up um, in the process. We want to concentrate them if we can. Maybe we can even recover them. So we want to track where they go uh, in that process. So we're applying three different uh, pretreatments. You probably are familiar with torrefaction and slow pyrolysis. They're very similar, torrefaction being a bit milder. Um, and those are more on the dry feedstocks themselves, uh, low or limited ox or no oxygen. And there, uh, we're trying to produce sort of a char or a solid product that we then send to uh, the gasification process. Torwash is probably new to some of you. Uh, this is a process uh, that I'll talk a, a little bit more about, but it's a hydrothermal process. So it involves water uh, and it's a mild form of hydrothermal carbonization. So we are working more with sludges or slurries. So with wet feedstocks. So in the case of a dry feedstock, we add water as well. And there we're looking to also upgrade the feedstock, improve the, improve the energy content of the solids, uh, and also improve the dewaterability after. So as I said, Torwash, this is a patented process. Mild, uh, mild temperatures uh, are usually around 200 degrees, depending on how you define mild. Um, and so you can vary the temperature, you can vary the pH, you can vary the residence time, and that's very important because we work with biomass, we work with waste. They're all very different. You might have a different uh, application in the end. Um, so you want to be able to have a little bit of control over your process. We do everything from lab scale, uh, which is batch processes, to pilot scale, which are continuous uh, processes. That's the capabilities we have uh, in our labs right now. And again, we work with 
ideally you work with a feedstock that's already wet, but in the case of um, a dry feedstock, you would add water to make a slurry. Um, and then when you dewater it uh, at the end, it's more easily dewaterable and it produces a solid fraction, but also a liquid fraction. And that liquid fraction also contains some organics and things get sort of washed out of the solids uh, under these conditions of temperature and pressure, like salts get washed out, uh, ash components get washed out. Um, and then that liquid fraction, you can digest it in an anaerobic digester to produce biogas. So you can valorize uh, that yeah. fraction as well. And more and more we're using it as in this uh, case in gold as a pretreatment option. So we want to sort of clean the solids for downstream processes. So that's how we're applying it in this case. So here's some results. So this is for sorghum. This is what this is the first feedstock we received. So we have the most results for it. And this shows the partitioning um, in the bars of the metals between the liquid fraction in the orange and the solid fraction in the blue. So what we see is that when we adjust the pH, so especially at a lower pH and a higher temperature, more of the metals become mobile um, and move into the, can be washed out in the liquid fraction. So that's what we want to do because then maybe we can recover them from the liquid fraction. So we have best results at temperatures of around 200 degrees and a pH of one to two. And this also holds uh, for other feedstocks that we've tested. So we just did some optimization tests with switchgrass and miscanthus. So same thing, uh, best results at a pH of, of one or two. Um, but note that of course at a larger scale, getting your uh, slurry down to a pH of one might not be feasible um, in, an e in economic terms. Um, we see some interesting behavior with nickel also, for example, it's quite sensitive to, to temperature. Um, so there's some kind of a tipping point or something there, uh, a temperature and pH for nickel. In this case, uh, for switchgrass, the aluminum stayed in the solids completely, no matter what, which was interesting. We didn't see that with the other feedstocks. But I think the concentrations are low. So again, we're looking at sort of general trends uh, and not absolute values. For torrefaction, we did this, uh, this is also for sorghum, that's what we've, we've done so far because this is at pilot scale, so with larger quantities of uh, feedstock. Uh, temperature was 280 degrees and uh, we have a pilot scale screw reactor that we feed at around uh, three kilograms per hour and it's continuous. And there you can see what it looks like before and after and that uh, sorghum has been sent to, to Munich for the gasification trials. Here's some results about the metals concentration. We just got these in the feedstock and then in the torrefied product. And we've already heard a little bit before about the volatility of some metals and they can be partially released uh, to the gas phase. So we're seeing that as well. Um, and basically the less volatile metals, and for the most part, the metals do stay, there's a lot of metals that stay in the solids. Um, and then that concentration is then proportional to the mass loss that you see because of the conditions that are applied. For slow pyrolysis, so this was done, as I said, by the partners uh, by Record. And um, first, similar to what we do with Torwash, uh, do optimization tests at lab scale. So this is a batch process uh, with the different biomass types, varying mostly temperature and uh, residence time. And then they look at the results of the char yield, for example, um, the surface area of the char, and um, <clears throat> also where, same, same thing, where do the metals uh, end up? And so what they see is that uh, the metals mostly stay in the char, uh, so similar with, uh, with torrefaction. And as you increase the severity, um, so residence time and temperature, you see a decrease in char yield. And at 600 degrees Celsius, the um, BET surface area of the char is really jumps up. So you see a clear sort of a delineation there. So based on these um, lab scale trials that they did, they determined that the optimum conditions for slow pyrolysis were uh, 600 degrees Celsius and 30 minutes residence time. So then they applied those conditions at pilot scale in their uh, slow pyrolysis reactor, which is very similar to our uh, reactor that we used uh, for our torrefaction tests. So it's also a screw reactor, similar feeding rate. Again, at the con conditions that I mentioned, and they did conventional, so without any air added, and then also um, a partially oxidative pyrolysis process where they added in a little bit of air. And then what they could see 
uh, is that um, when they add air, they get a higher yield of the aqueous phase, but the char and the um, uh, char and the gas uh, and the oil phase is, is decreased. But also with the addition of a little bit of air, um, you see the surface area also increases. So those are the results uh, for pyrolysis at pilot scale. And then also just uh, quickly, um, so I mentioned with Torawash, you add water. So you end up with a slurry and you dewater it and you have the solids. So we have the solids and we send those to, to Munich for uh, the gasification test. And then we have this uh, liquid phase and you can see it in the picture there. And it's very uh, nice, dark uh, brown color. So there's a lot of humic substances also in there from the, uh, from the biomass, as well as a lot of metals, so because of course we were trying to move the metals into the, into the liquid phase. So we're trying to do some separation tests. We tried some uh, membrane filtration, uh, pre-filtration, and then some, some uh, nanofiltration. We'll try with ultrafiltration as well. Um, it's very difficult. It really fouls the membrane quickly. It's a very slow process. So then we just tried uh, to do some precipitation and that worked quite well at a small, uh, small scale. So basically we just acidified it to a pH of one and then you can see that the humic substances uh, precipitate out. We can separate them and we can uh, sort of reconstitute them and adjust the pH. And what we see when we look at the, I don't have the numbers here, but um, what we see is that the humics precipitate out, but the metals are not bound to the humic substances. Uh, the metals stay in the solution. So we can recover um, this humic substances and then we'll send it uh, to Eleni and it'll be tested also as a, as a soil, um, soil additive in the project. And then the metals stay in solution and then we're also gonna do some adsorption tests um, with the biochar uh, made with slow pyrolysis to see if we can adsorb some of the metals out of solution. And I think that is my last slide. So now for route two. We do that. Okay, following up with route uh, two, which is the uh, route uh, proposed by the University of Sherbrooke, um, there are three items we'll touch today. The first one is the uh, uh, bubbling fluid bed out the thermal pyrolysis unit which is essentially a scale up from previous uh, tests and we try to bring the technology at the TRL six or even close to seven. The company which is following this uh, uh, in, in Canada, they are interested in investing for a TRL eight unit uh, later based on the results we obtain, not only for biomass, but also for plastic waste. So it's a combined effort. Uh, the second one is the catalytic reforming. So the gas can be uh, reform catalytically using a, a proprietary catalyst which has been developed also at the University of Sherbrooke and is based on a, a mining residue, the metallurgical residue as a support. We call it uh, nickel UGSO, uh, upgraded slag oxide coming from mining of titanium and which has a negative value. And then finally the um, ash slag which is essentially carbon rich uh, produced through this uh, pyrolysis, and we examine the possibility of using this uh, material uh, as an absorbent uh, after, um, essentially, as you will see, there was not enough metals inside uh, the biomass we have received. So we have doped uh, this with additional metal just to simulate uh, the case where the biomass is uh, more contaminated with metals. So that's the tasks essentially which are bringing forward in, in goal. Uh, Autothermal pyrolysis, catalytic cracking and reforming and fissure drops. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, we, we are in good advancement in all of them. So the feedstock we have received because as you know, we cannot import biomass from Europe. Uh, there are two entities working with us is uh, Jardin Botanique de Montréal, uh, Professor Michel Labrec and I think Effie has talked with uh, him. And uh, also Serum, which is a center for research on grains, and uh, they are responsible for the phytoremediation in Quebec. And then they um, uh, gave us a significant amount of um, uh, these uh, two biomasses. 
Panicum virgatum and uh, willow. And after physical pretreatment, washing with water, drying over 105, and grinding and sieving less than one millimeters. And as we can see, the, the content uh, in metals uh, is, as uh, we saw here, it's relatively low, uh, coming from contaminated areas. And we have used this for making uh, pyrolysis, batch pyrolysis, and to see how these uh, metals behave. Uh, but at the end, uh, we, in order to examine the possibility of using this as uh, an adsorbent material, we have doped with copper, as you see, uh, to see what is the effect on, uh, on the results. So that's a typical uh, thick bed biorolysis at uh, low scale. We have performed at a relatively high temperature. This is relatively um, a sp a speedy biorolysis. However, uh, what we expect to have from the uh, scale-up unit is much different because the uh, is, is a continuous unit and the residence time is much uh, lesser. Uh, so this is uh, the results we have obtained for the fixed bed pyrolysis. We see the distribution in gas, uh, solids, and uh, liquids. And uh, we see that if we contaminate uh, with uh, copper, we have a thermogravimetric analysis which is slightly different. So we have at the end a higher um, residue remaining. And with uh, the um, analysis, we, we can have a variety of uh, products produced in the liquid phase. So this is the ATP, the autothermal uh, reforming platform of the GRTP, which is also covered by a, a couple of patents. Uh, the main unit is uh, what you see here is, uh, is a vessel of about three tons. Uh, it's a big vessel which has a nominal capacity of treatment of for biomass five kilos per hour. It's a fluidized bed uh, fed with a screw feeder. Uh, the, main, um, the main innovation in this, and this is why uh, we call it autothermal, is because the, the uh, lower part, what we see here, the lower part of the vessel, uh, is used as an oxidation reactor using part of the gas of the pyrolysis to provide the heat for the uh, remaining pyrolysis of the, of the solids. Uh, and uh, the, the gas uh, liquid, uh, condensable and non-condensable, go through a, a, a washing tower, which is a skimmer tower, and then uh, the uh, liquid is accumulated in these two tanks. And after, uh, after phase separation, the uh, liquid, which is essentially water, in the, in the washing tower is recycled back until we have saturation. So the, in that way we decrease the amount of water which is used. Uh, and uh, the gases uh, go, go through a, a cleaning, uh, essentially is a cleaning based on the, in another washing through ethylene glycol to remove all, all uh, water until, uh, and then it can be used uh, for the tests of reforming, and the remaining, which is not used uh, at this scale, is uh, uh, driven to a flare and burned uh, in accordance with uh, the health and safety rules. So this is essentially a, a fairly industrial unit. Uh, we have the same norms and safety measures as an industrial unit, which is not easy to operate. Typically, we have uh, runs uh, of approximately 50 to 60 hours, um, and uh, another, uh, a number of people participate in the shifts, but we have also a, um, a, the possibility to follow the heating uh, period, which is uh, um, unattended uh, from, from home with, uh, with computers. So this is, saves some time. Uh, so um, the, um, we have completed, uh, the, the, the unit is commissioned fully, and we have tested it first with a plastic stream because it's more easy to feed, and we have a full uh, mass balance. And typically, the, we have a pyrolytic uh, oils, which is about 50%, the salt is about 13%, and gas is about 26%, and 12% is water, which is essentially coming from the combustion of the gas, uh, in that case, we have simulated the pyrolysis gas with propane. So the propane is burned, provides the energy to preheat the reactor, and then we continue to burn at the appropriate amount, which is equivalent to the, uh, uh, to the enthalpy, which is used for the endothermic reaction of the pyrolysis. 
so the, uh, since the, the, the biomass we have used was uh, not very contaminated, I have found a, a site uh, of ancient mine which is close to Sherbrooke, the Eustis 1B. And we, you see that uh, we have collected this by ourselves. So we were here and we have cut this biomass. And we have separated in different uh, parts, roots, uh, herbs, leaves, stems, and so on. And we see that it's uh, heavily contaminated with uh, iron, manganese, uh, magnesium, uh, nickel, and uh, copper, and, and so on. And uh, this biomass is intended to be used now for the testing because we have uh, like a real contaminated thing. And as you see, the pond you see here is red. So it's <laughs> obvious that it's uh, fairly, fairly contaminated. Now, um, I uh, present you also what we, we do with uh, the um, solids. Uh, solids contaminated with copper. We have uh, reticulated uh, the char with uh, calcium and uh, with a process we are mastering uh, more and more. We produce this, uh, this uh, hydrogel, uh, it's an alginate hydrogel, and this is when it contains uh, the solids. Uh, it is uh, produced uh, through a powder mixture and a bulk milled uh, system. Uh, it's uh, fairly uh, homogeneous and uh, we used it uh, as uh, an absorbent. And we use it both for liquid uh, containing contamination in metals, and also for the absorbent of CO2 from gases, so in two cases. The first one, we have tested it with two nitrophenol and was very efficient, and I have presented the last time when we, we met on Wagenigen. Uh, and uh, these are the tests we have obtained with uh, two uh, charts uh, with uh, this name, and we see uh, the capacity of the absorption. Uh, it's, uh, here is written in French but it's the same thing, it, uh, absorption capacity in millimole per gram. And uh, we see that uh, there are differences as function of the temperature of, uh, of, the, um, of the treatment. So these uh, are uh, uh, transmission and uh, 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 electron microscopy uh, of this uh, material. And what you see as bright is the copper contamination, artificial contamination. So we have discussed last time that we do not know if the metals which are physically present in the biomass uh, coming from contaminated sites will be behaving the same way as the metals which are doping the ashes or the, uh, the, the solids. Uh, so obviously if the uh, system is more biologic, uh, we have low temperatures, probably will be different. But for systems which are treated at 700 and 800, uh, at these conditions, we do not believe that the artificial contamination will behave differently than the, the, the uh, contamination coming naturally from the mines. So uh, we see uh, the type of distribution of these metals. And we see uh, that uh, when we do this uh, uh, pyrolysis, uh, for example, the copper, uh, which has been recovered by the char, uh, is uh, typically uh, higher than 75%. So more, most of the copper is found in the solid. This means that uh, for each metal, and you know very well, each metal has its own distribution uh, factors as function of the volatility and uh, the uh, tendency to remain in the solids or not. So the last thing I will show you is the dry reforming at high temperature and pressure. Um, we have another platform, which is also kilolab scale. Typically, a catalytic uh, tests uh, are performed in small reactors with one to two grams catalyst. In that case, we have a, a reactor made of uh, um, Inconel 400, which is able to go at high pressures and high temperatures, and um, is able to be loaded with about one kilo. So it's a scale up of about 1,000. And with this, we simulate exactly what happens in industry in terms of reforming, dry, wet, or partial oxidation. It's very important because when we will proceed to combine uh, the results of the pyrolysis with the reforming in the industry, in order to have a good uh, uh, conditions, we have to operate at high pressure. Uh, a low pressure operation of reforming is not allowed in the industry for reasons that uh, I, I will explain another time because we do not have uh, time. So this is the, the platform. This is essentially the main, uh, the reactor I talked about is a fixed bed. 
uh, which can be operated up to 916 atmospheres. Uh, these are, are the uh, analysis, the mapping analysis of the catalyst. Uh, the catalyst can be used as powder or as pellets. We have a system to produce pellets uh, by adding um, uh, uh, additives and uh, extruding and uh, calcining. So we have tested both powder and pellets, and surprisingly, pellets uh, behave uh, better despite the fact that we have one-tenth of the specific surface for reasons also which are very uh, long to explain uh, another time. So we see here the distribution of the nickel uh, in, the, in the system. And uh, generally, as a discussion, we can say that pellets perform better at higher pressure. Uh, lower specific surface is offset by better nickel dispersion. Uh, there is less coke formation over the pellet, uh, which is distributed uh, because of the silicate dispersion. And the powder performs better at lower pressures. But this is not very important for the industrial side. Uh, so if we see what we obtain, we obtain very good stability. But up to four hours, we, we have uh, tests also which go up to 55 hours. Uh, so we see uh, what we obtain in terms of, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, methane conversion, hydrogen conversion, CO2 conversion, and uh, CO yield. So we see that it's quite stable, and we see that uh, as function of the pressure up to 10 atmospheres, uh, the uh, results are changing. If we compare this with the thermodynamic calculations, we are very close to thermodynamic calculations. For the moment, I cannot uh, show you the uh, Gazzauli space velocity because this is still unpublished, is uh, under evaluation, but uh, is, uh, is, uh, are conditions which are very close to the conditions of the industry. And uh, there is a, a, a big industry which is interested because it's Rio Tinto, iron, and, and titanium. Uh, these guys produce the upgraded slug oxide, which is essentially used to bring the cost of the catalyst down by a factor of 10. Usually the catalysts which are used in the industry are based on nickel, on alumina, doped with magnesia, and this costs uh, about uh, 5 to 10 times more what we produce here. And that's why the company is interested eventually to uh, use their, uh, the, uh, the residue for this type of catalyst and participate eventually in, uh, in, in a spin-off or something, a company which uh, will produce the, the catalyst. So in summary, we have the things which are presented by Heather already. So the large-scale route to two commissioned and the first continuous pyrolysis test are a, a reality. We have uh, full mass balances and we are preparing to have the same thing for the different types of uh, uh, of uh, biomasses. The catalytic reforming test at high TNP with uh, the proprietary ca catalyst UGSO proved very, very positive. So we continue in this direction. And the next step is uh, to take the liquids and crack them uh, also with uh, catalysts coming from the same source uh, in order to improve. And it's uh, definitely one of the main things which uh, are important when we switch to these biomasses is that the liquids, uh, pyrolysis liquids, will contain more oxygen than the liquids uh, which has been produced by plastics. And this can change uh, some of the uh, behaviors during the next steps. So the pyrolysis solids uh, of copper contaminated biomass are used to produce alginate beads. These alginate beads are used in adsorption runs, both for liquids and gases, and uh, with very satisfactory results, very small scale though. So thank you, thank you very much. And um, we keep going. Thank you very much, um, both speakers. Here. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Nicholas. Okay. As you have heard um, in the in the framework of the Ceresis project, uh, we developed two different uh, technologies. I will uh, present you the the first one, which is the conversion. Uh, of uh, and contaminant separation technologies, starting with the supercritical water gasification. 
Um, I would uh, like to thank uh, the um, organizers of this meeting to giving me the opportunity to do this live. <laughs> the ECWG process chain starts uh, with uh, dilution of the dry biomass with water and uh, the, pro the main product of the gasification is the gas which, which has to uh, be cleaned, especially and then it follows the reforming of the hydrocarbons, a reverse water gas shift reaction, a fissiotrop synthesis, and the products of the fissiotrop synthesis will be dis uh, separated by distillation. There is, of course, a second mass stream leaving the process, which is a brine, and this brine will contain the um, uh, heavy metals and uh, decontaminated by electrochemical treatments. In the framework of Ceresis, this is the work package three. Uh, leader is KIT and contributing partners are uh, CERT, Université de Serbrook, uh, but another professor, uh, Nata Pazzolu, uh, Jean-Michel Lavoie, and, uh, and the national Technical University of Athens. <clears throat> I will start uh, with the um, supercritical water gasification, the work done in our labs. And uh, this work uh, is uh, since uh, two years performed by uh, Mr. Julian Ducci, a valuable uh, PhD student of my group. The biomass, as I said, will be uh, form a slurry, will be pumped in uh, continuously in a system uh, of heat exchangers, salt separation and reactor, and that uh, under harsh conditions like pressure of 280 bar and temperatures of about 650 centigrade, biomass will react with the water and form a combustible gas consisting of hydrogen, methane, CO2, and some ethane. You notice there is uh, almost no CO. CO concentrations are lower than 5%. Of course, there is wastewater. This is the largest uh, mass leaving the system. But the wastewater can be recycled in order to dilute the biomass and save fresh water. There is the... Uh, salt brine I mentioned containing heavy metals but also potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium. On the middle you see a photograph of the lab uh, scale plant we use for uh, the framework of the Ceres uh, project with a capacity of one kilogram per hour and on the very right uh, our pilot plant with a capacity of 100 kilogram per hour which uh, uh, was in operation between 2000 uh, and uh, 2018, and now our uh, these days will be sold to one company. <clears throat> the benefits of the technology are that uh, decentralized applications are feasible. Various biomasses, wet and dry, can be used as feedstock. The product gas is rich in hydrogen and methane and uh, can be directly used to produce uh, heat and then perhaps electricity. The separation of inorganic contaminants within the process is possible without uh, uh, additional energy and uh, the organic contaminants should be decomposed. The first experiments were difficult relatively low gasification efficiency, about uh, up to 75%. Some carbon still contained in the effluent. Salt separation needed to be improved and some formation of coke in the reactor has been observed. In the framework of the Ceresis project, we performed over 90 experiments and we reached more than 100 hours of continuous operation and gasification efficiencies, uh, carbon 
gasification efficiency of about 90%. We gained important knowledge. The process effluent, as I mentioned, can be recycled. The process effluent is free of heavy metals. There is no significant difference in the gasification of the different biomasses. Also important process parameters leading to solid deposition have been identified. And the last but not least, a lot of uh, publications have been um, released. Oh, I am sorry for the formatting, but uh, it is a common um, problem if I do not use my own um, laptop. The product uh, gas has to be cleaned. The technology, our colleagues at CERT uh, have uh, uh, chosen was the membrane gas absorption. This technology enables very high and well-defined contact area, independent gas and liquid flows, no flooding, hold up, foaming, etc. The mode of operation is uh, uh, counter current. Yes, I have. I cannot switch the last. Next. Uh, am I not only for mating, but also <laughs> go forward? What happened? Should be. Okay, yeah, yeah. now it is okay. I will go back. Okay, thanks. Here you can see some uh, uh, complicated diagrams. Important is that uh, if someone will use uh, methyl diethanolamine, uh, selective separation of, of uh, H2S is possible, while with uh, diethanolamine, combined H2S and CO2 removal are possible. The liquid flow rate can be used to control the purification level and uh, very important, there are no losses of methane and hydrogen. <clears throat> Next step is uh, to adjust the product gas in order to be able to perform later fissotrop synthesis. And the technology the, in the University of Sherbrooke uh, has uh, developed is uh, uh, to dry reforming which is the reaction between methane and CO2, and it, uh, this results to hydrogen and CO. Catalyst was intended to be steel wool, but uh, in the, the course of the experiments, the reactor material uh, seems to be the better catalyst. Here you can see the results. On the left side, is a comparison of the results uh, using all the Inconel reactor with and without steel wool as catalyst. You can see that higher conversions were achieved without a catalyst with a maximum of 100% methane um, conversion at 950 centigrade. On the right side, you can see a comparison between a reactor without steel wool. Uh, one, in one case, the reactor was made of stainless steel, and in another case, of Inconel 625. Especially the right di very right diagram is uh, very impressive. The reactor, the, uh, you can see almost no conversion in the reactor with uh, stainless, made of stainless steel and almost 100% uh, conversion in the case of Inconel 625. It is not the first time Inconel 625 appears to be a good catalyst for such mm -hmm. reactions. Next step is the Fischer-Tropp synthesis. And uh, here the University of Sherbrooke synthesized uh, structure catalyst. You can see some pictures in the middle. And uh, our colleagues uh, reached 85% conversion of hydrogen uh, gas to biofuels. As you can see on the top, 
there is almost uh, no loss of activity over the 50 hours of this measurement and the lower uh, right diagram shows a good mixture of alkanes. Another experiment uh, was a 100 hour run performed very successful very, with very high CO conversion of a complete uh, time of steam, 90% and no significant deactivation. In this uh, colorful slide, you see experiments with different porosity of the structures catalyst and promoters uh, for iron. Uh, these are liquid products with different fractions from alkanes to water. Important is that the organic products are in the range of diesel. Um, I mentioned that, that also uh, the brine should be decontaminated. And the target was to develop a hybrid electrocoagulation, electrochemical oxidation process for effective uh, removal of organics and heavy metals from the brine. The challenge is to, uh, to avoid the usage of uh, chemicals and to reduce energy consumption. We uh, tested lead as an uh, example of heavy metals and phenol as organic contaminant, and lead ions can be effectively removed at low current densities, removal up to 98% with only 10 milliampere per square centimeter uh, current nine minutes of electrolysis time and pH of 10. In the framework of Ceres's project, strong modeling activities are implemented. And CERT uh, uh, has uh, uh, performed a kinetic modeling of the supercritical water gasification using a gas phase mechanism. And after uh, one or two modifications, a successful match with the experimental data has been reached. Now to the last slide of my presentation, the National Technical University of Athens performed a modeling of the whole process from biomass up to uh, physiotropes products. And uh, the, the, uh, the target is to, to identify key operating conditions and optimum scenarios in respect of uh, product yield and uh, minimizing uh, heat demand. And these results, and not the original experimental results, will be used as input for the life cycle analysis, which is performed in the work package four. You see that uh, products are diesel, gasoline, and jet fuel. And now it is a technical uh, difficulty because uh, we can switch to uh, to yeah. online Thank and you. Paola so, uh, will... Paola, if you can yeah. hear us, can you hear us? You can switch on your... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you can share your screen. Yes. Okay. Just... We can hear you and see you, so that's the first challenge. Perfect. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, as Nikron introduced, uh, I will present uh, the route that we explored in Ceresis that starts from contaminated biomass to produce biofuel through pyrolysis. And uh, the idea uh, uh, underpinning uh, this activity is to optimize the pyrolysis for the uh, production of a clean bio oil, taking in mind uh, the presence of contaminants uh, such as the metals in feedstock. We tried to achieve this goal in services by optimizing and integrating different processes, starting from uh, um, thermal and uh, mechanical pretreatment of the biomass, uh, passing through pyrolysis, uh, 
combustion of the pyrolysis gas to sustain, uh, to, not su exactly to sustain, but to, to help uh, pyrolysis from the energetic point of view. And finally, the post-treatment through microfiltration of the bio-oil. I, I will focus on some specific aspects of, of this work, and I will start from pyrolysis. Uh, the goal of the activity was to achieve a compromise between the bio-oil yield and the minimization of the heavy metals contamination in bio-oil. Uh, the goal was achieved through the use of robust technology, the identification of its critical operating parameters, and finally, uh, a quite extensive experimental campaign to assess the performance of the technology with different feedstock. Uh, the technology was uh, a proven technology for uh, clean biomass, but we have to take into uh, uh, mind the presence of contaminants in this case. The plant uh, that was designed and built uh, at CNR uh, is, uh, uh, consists in two parts, the pyrolysis part and the condensation unit. Uh, as for pyrolysis, as I have said, we decided to use a proven technology, a screw reactor. Um, in this case, we uh, sacrificed a little bit uh, the yield of the oil because uh, uh, this reactor is not able to achieve the fast heating rate that is needed to maximize bio yield. But uh, we did. We, mm, took this decision in favor of a robust technology and flexible technology in terms of uh, um, uh, biomass feed. So I mean uh, that this type of reactor can accept a wide range of particle size, can allow a good control of the residence time of the biomass uh, uh, in the uh, reactor and of the temperature and allow good mixing um, characteristics. Um, regarding condensation, uh, we uh, decided to um, include a high temperature and low temperature condenser in order to um, separate at the production, uh, directly at the production, the oil phase from the aqueous phase in principle. Uh, so so in, we in, in principle can do this, but in the framework of this project, uh, uh, we uh, always worked with the wool bio oil, with the collection of the wool bio oil. Uh, we uh, uh, started from, uh, uh, we tried different configurations of the reactor, uh, starting uh, originally uh, with the, uh, the heating uh, by induction only of the screw. Uh, the idea was to optimize uh, the, not only the, the temperature inside the reactor, but also the heating rate. Uh, but we didn't obtain good performances, so we uh, up, um, upgraded the reactor and we replaced the external ceramic tube with uh, a steel tube. And we tried to heat up the reactor by induction heating, but the conditions were not yet satisfying. So we, in the final configuration, we decided to use uh, uh, traditional radiant panels to heat up the reactor. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we um, operated the reactor, uh, the, the, the condensation system, in a way that we can separate the oil phase from the aqueous phase if needed. Uh, and the results were uh, satisfactory in this case. Um, we tried to identify the, the critical parameters uh, that were quite known for the bio oil yield, but less known for the displacement of heavy metals into the pyrolysis products. Uh, we uh, investigated the temperature, uh, carrier gas flow rate, and uh, biomass uh, residence time. And we monitored the, the yield of the bio oil, the water content, and the content of solids and heavy metals. Here. I reported an example uh, obtained with the uh, reed canary grass, but we tested this condition uh, also with other biomass in services products available in services uh, project. Um, regarding temperature, uh, we have observed that uh, in the temperature range that we have investigated, uh, it has a negligible influence on bio yield. 
uh, but um, it has a strong influence on the quality of the bio oil because the water content decreases by increasing the pyrolysis temperature, even though it is still quite high because we are not under fast pyrolysis condition, but under intermediate pyrolysis condition. Um, the uh, content of contaminants, in this case, in the case of reed canary grass, uh, the contaminants was zinc, uh, increases uh, in the bio oil increases with the temperature. And by conductive batch experiments in another reactor where particle entrainment uh, is not present, uh, we were able to distinguish the uh, contamination, the zinc that is devolatilized, and the zinc that is uh, driven by the um, solid particles um, entrained in the uh, vapor uh, flow uh, before condensation. And uh, um, with these experiments, we uh, observed that uh, the contamination was mainly due to the devolatilization and not to the elutriation of solid particles during in the reactor. Uh, then we analyzed the uh, effect of uh, gas flow rate uh, and we uh, observed that uh, uh, under a critical gas flow rate uh, uh, value, uh, the bio oil lead was significantly reduced, whereas uh, uh, the content of zinc and lead uh, also, because in this case we used another biomass that was contaminated by zinc and lead, um, the, the, the displacement of these two metals was not affected by the carrier gas flow rate. And this is in line, in agreement with what we have observed before. Uh, when we said that uh, uh, the contamination of bio oil is mainly due to devolatilization rather than solid elutriation. Finally, uh, uh, with solid residence time was not so critical, at least in the range that we have examined, um, because it didn't affect uh, nor the bio oil yield or the uh, zinc and lead content in the bio oil. And uh, uh, this is why uh, in the reactor, we have uh, a, a quite long uh, high temperature isothermal zone. And uh, uh, in this case, also in, uh, in the minimum residence time that we have uh, investigated, it is enough to maximize the bio oil yield in this reactor. Then after this experimental campaign, uh, aimed to identify the most critical parameters for um, by oil contamination, we have uh, tested the different biomasses, 11 uh, types of biomass, uh, 11 biomass, eight types uh, of woody and herbaceous, uh, and two types of contamination, lead and zinc. Um, we are still uh, um, analyzed in the results that we have obtained with other biomass that are contaminated by chromium and nickel. I will not show you the result in this presentation, uh, but uh, what we observed is that from the point of view of bio oil yield, there is not a relevant influence of the uh, composition of the initial biomass. Uh, consider that the, uh, all these biomass have very high ash content, so uh, this is one of the reasons for the low yield uh, of bio oil observed that uh, is comprised between uh, 30 and 38%. Uh, but also, as I said before, the heating rate in the reactor is not uh, uh, as bad as it should be for um, fast pyrolysis. Um, and what we observed also is that lead and zinc are mainly retained in the char, uh, depending on the temperature from 90 to 70 percent of the initial uh, lead and zinc is retained in the char. And the uh, main contribution to uh, by oil contamination is due to the volatilization and uh, rather than to solid elutriation. Um, finally, we uh, regarding the pyrolysis activity, uh, we also um, investigated the composition of the gas phase, and uh, we didn't find any relevant difference between the biomass tested except for as an pruning. Uh, the uh, gas yield was uh, in range of 31-37%, uh, with a high calorific value of 11 megajoule per kilogram on average, except for as an uh, where the calorific value of the gas was uh, 
measured and uh, was higher than the other case. It was important to study also the gas phase because as I showed you before in the scheme, we also conducted at CNR uh, an activity on the uh, combustion of this gas. Uh, this gas uh, uh, has a very low calorific value, so uh, uh, it's burning in a traditional uh, burner can be quite challenging. Uh, so we decided to explore uh, a specific regime of combustion that is known as mild combustion that uh, uh, is uh, obtained with a high level of dilution of the fuel load and uh, uh, with a high um, preheating temperature of the uh, fuel uh, load. And uh, uh, this con in these conditions, it is possible to stabilize the combustion without a flame front uh, and uh, um, also for fuel that uh, um, are characterized by very low calorific value. Um, the condition the, the, of the mild regime were achieved uh, in a reactor that was designed at CNR, uh, where the cyclonic flow of uh, the exhaust gas uh, is able to dilute um, efficiently uh, the fuel load. Uh, as you can see in the picture in center, um, that is uh, an optical uh, an optical uh, uh, diagnostic of the uh, of the combustion. Uh, the combustion is occurring, but no flame uh, is inside the, bar the burner. The combustion is flameless. So um, this reactor was already tested for other um, fuels, um, from fossil fuel to alternative fuels. But the goal in this case is to uh, verify the suitability of this process for the combustion of a typical pyrolysis gas that has very low calorific value. Uh, and to identify which are the operating condition, the range of operating condition where a stable combustion can be uh, achieved and also low emissions in terms of pollutants of CO and NOx can be obtained. Uh, we choose to use different types of ga uh, gas to uh, take into account the variability of gas composition. And in all the case, even in case of very low calorific value in the order of three megajoules per kilograms, a stable combustion uh, has been achieved. So the tests of the pyrolysis cases were uh, successful. Um, and from the point of view of stability of combustion, but also from the point of view of emissions, because as you can see in these two graphs, uh, both CO and, and or NOx uh, emissions were uh, below the uh, regulatory limits for furnaces uh, for a wide range of operating conditions. But now let's go to the treatment of the bio-oil, because as we have seen, we have still a contamination, and part of this contamination uh, uh, is due to the presence of uh, particles, uh, solid particles. So um, in this uh, uh, pathway, a mercury filtration process has been uh, investigated by CERT. And... Uh, um, the, the important thing that I want to highlight is that typically uh, the microfiltration is conducted with polymeric membrane uh, with uh, using uh, two microfiltrate aqueous phase uh, uh, liquid. In this case, uh, um, CERT um, was able to develop a process uh, that can be uh, applied to uh, bio oil. Uh, by using in this, they tested different membranes uh, and uh, they chose as uh, uh, as uh, optimal membrane a ceramic membrane uh, that was tested uh, with the bio oil produced at CNR. And uh, uh, as you can see from the uh, pictures uh, on, the upper part, uh, on the upper part of the slide, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, content of solid in the permeate uh, after 15 minutes of operation is significantly reduced with respect to the concentrate. 
And also another important point was that the fooling of the ceramic membrane uh, was found to be reversible uh, after a simple cleaning with uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, as for supercritical water gasification, also for the pyrolysis route, a, a strong activity on the uh, modeling part uh, has been done. Um, and uh, regarding the pyrolysis uh, model that was developed, uh, it was validated with the experimental results obtained uh, in the uh, um, project. And uh, uh, the important thing is that in this model, it was included uh, a mathematical methodology for the incorporation of the possible effects of contaminants uh, in the uh, products of the process. Uh, on the pro uh, what I have to say is that in the case of Ceresis project, the level of contaminants of the biomass that was in the order of 100 ppm was not so high to um, affect the pyrolysis, uh, uh, the, the yield of the pyrolysis products. But in any case, uh, in the model, this uh, uh, option is included uh, for uh, other types of biomass that are characterized by higher, uh, higher heavy metals concentration, like, for example, hyperaccumulator biomass. Uh, the model uh, was able to predict with uh, uh, a good accuracy uh, uh, both the uh, bio-oil and the char yield, and uh, um, that we have obtained uh, uh, with the experimental activity at CNR. Um, and the model was uh, developed uh, in collaboration uh, by uh, uh, Technical University of Athens and CERT. Uh, and uh, um, also they included, uh, uh, coupled the um, pyrolysis model with a uh, model for the um, further um, upgrading of the bio-oil. Uh, uh, the experimental activity on this part uh, was not uh, uh, an aim, uh, was not included in the project, but uh, from the modeling uh, um, point of view, it was also uh, investigated. Uh, and the results of this model gave first indications of the uh, yield on the yield of uh, the end products like gasoline, diesel, and LPG uh, that can be obtained starting from the biomass. And uh, in this case, also the effect of uh, um, moisture and ash in the initial biomass was uh, included to predict. Uh, uh, the uh, the final yield of the end product. So in conclusion, what we have learned after this experience in series is um, security actors is a viable technology to treat heavy metal contaminated biomass, uh, even though uh, the, um, the, the yield of the bio oil are not so high uh, as uh, in traditional 